can hear us on Zoom, right? Okay, good. Thanks. Let me change this. Let me see. Okay, medium light is fine. Or we could do low light. Is it better? Oh, you okay, thanks. I don't know if this is better. It looks similar. Everything is good? Okay, well, let's wait for a minute and then we can get started. Okay, I think we can get started. Okay, good to see people attending still. <laughs> yeah, so we have, uh, we're going to continue covering uh, interconnects with a major focus on on-chip networks today and router design. As I said, this is a topic that can take much longer actually, and then it will span off to networking as well, but we don't have time for it. So we're going to limit it to today. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about bottleneck acceleration. That could be a remote lecture because I have a conflict actually. So we'll see how we resolve that time conflict uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And next week, uh, next week we're not going to have lectures. Uh, it's going to be time for you to study. Uh, I mean, we might have research lectures. How many people would like research lectures next week? Some people. Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Okay, you two hands over there. How many people do not want research lectures? Okay. How many people don't care? In the end, you won't be, uh, uh, basically whatever material is covered, if we decide to cover it next week, uh, you won't be responsible for it in the exam or homeworks anywhere, basically. So it doesn't matter <laughs> in the end. So we'll see. Some people are enthusiastic about it. Some people don't care. But basically, whatever we uh, do next week, they're not going to be uh, on the exam. Uh, or on the homework because there won't be lectures. Uh, but uh, uh, hopefully you've, you've seen the message that we released some discussion videos. So you will, uh, uh, those are essentially solutions to a bunch of homework and exam problems if you're interested in seeing them. And I would suggest if you're interested in learning more, attend the, uh, attend the office hours. We might have another discussion session next week. Uh, I don't think we'll have two research lectures if you have research lectures. We might have another discussion session one of the days. And then the exam is the week after, as you know. But as I said, you don't need to uh, sweat much about the exam. Uh, there are many ways of getting a good grade in this course, uh, and you can balance based on uh, the different possibilities, right? Any questions on logistics? And today I'd like to give you some time so that you can actually fill in the course evaluations. I value that feedback. The course improves with that feedback uh, over time. Uh, but we will discuss that probably during the break uh, sometime. Okay, so let's talk about uh, on-chip networks. Just to uh, remind you where we were last time, we covered a lot of interconnection network basics. And we actually went into a lot of detail on different topologies. Uh, we talked about routing algorithms, and we talked about buffering and flow control. And we saw this in a general sense. We didn't really specifically focus on trade-offs uh, on-chip versus off-chip. But these interconnection networks are employed inside a chip. These interconnection networks are employed uh, to connect multiple chips, multiple different chips in a single module, for example, and also many different chips as well in a supercomputer, uh, for example, and also in a data center. Uh, and in the end, uh, uh, in, uh, the internet is connected in some way, right? Basically, interconnection networks span all of our 
let's say, lives, if you will. And then there's a wireless version of it, which we're not going to clearly talk about in this course. Uh, but people are also talking about wireless communication, even within a chip these days. I'm not sure if it's really a good trade-off, but uh, these things are being investigated, basically wireless optical communication, different sort of communication methods are being investigated. Uh, so today we're going to focus more on the uh, on-chip uh, side, and we're going to talk about all of these different aspects, but we're going to look into some specific interesting things. Uh, we've talked about buffered flow control. Again, this is to jog your memory. We've talked about uh, how to uh, manage the buffers, if you will. One way of managing the buffers was store and forward, uh, which allocates buffers for the entire packet, but this is not efficient. So we shrunk the buffers and reduced the latency and arrived at wormhole routing, where we divide the packet into head, body, and tail flits. And routing happens only at the granularity of the head flits and body and tail fail, uh, follow the head flits based on information that's kept in the router after the head flit is routed, for example. So that's called wormhole. Essentially, it's called wormhole because uh, if a, a, a big packet is divided into small pieces, kind of like a worm. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, different pieces are in different routers. And essentially, those different pieces all follow the head. And then we discuss some issues. If you have a single buffer, uh, FIFO buffer, you have the head of line blocking issue. Uh, when one, uh, one head uh, cannot move to the output port, it basically uh, blocks another uh, head of a worm that can use that output port. This is because of FIFO scheduling. So we basically said that you could actually solve this problem using virtual channels, whatever it's called, virtual channels. It's essentially multiple smaller FIFOs, if you will. If you want to keep the same amount of buffering, it's multiple smaller FIFOs in the end. So multiple FIFOs and scheduling at the heads of those FIFOs enables you to uh, essentially reduce the set of line blocking. So this is all old news, if you will. And these are all employed in uh, some of the modern on-chip routers, as well as off-chip routers, as we discussed uh, last time. So we said also that communicating buffer availability is not easy. We discussed several methods for doing that. All of these actually complicate the system. Today, we're going to uh, talk about, let's say, a um, maybe different approach and talk about how, get, how can we actually uh, get rid of buffers as much as possible? Can we get rid of them completely? Uh, or what do we do, basically, if we want to revisit uh, the on-chip network design so that we can make it very, very efficient and high performance at the same time. So it's good to re-examine these concepts in a, uh, let's say, different way. Uh, and I will give you that some history also on this one. Okay, any questions on this? I think this is, this is all a review. This is kind of review. We've discussed the load latency curve, so this should not be unfamiliar to you. This is, in general, the curve that you get whenever you have resources and whenever you're putting some load, injecting some uh, load in those resources. So this is a very uh, fundamental curve, as we discussed in an earlier lecture when we talked about contention, right? So on the x-axis, you see the load or injection rate into the network. This could be specified with some metric, for example, packets per cycle per node. It could be that sort of metric. You will see some examples soon. Uh, and on the y-axis, you see the latency of a packet. Now, this could be also specified based on some metric. This could be the average latency uh, observed in an application. Uh, across the entire run. It could be the average latency observed in a synthetic traffic pattern, as we will see in a little bit. It could be the maximum latency observed for any packet. So basically, this could be different types of latency, and it could be measured in different ways. But regardless of how you measure it in general, it behaves this way, especially the average latency behaves this way. As your injection rate increases to the network, your latency is somewhat constant when the load is low, but when the load becomes higher, your latency starts increasing because of contention that happens in the network. And then at some point, your latency shoots up uh, to unreasonable levels, let's say. We're going to have a specific name for those levels. Uh, that uh, you cannot push the load in the network further. Now, this injection rate may, be, it may happen. This, this, this curve clearly depends on the traffic pattern and the application. So this curve is not independent of that. This depends on how you're communicating across the network. And this, but, all, but this also depends on the network design itself. Clearly, it depends on the application that's running on the network, the communication patterns that you see, but also the network design. So let's take a look at the effect of network design. So there's some minimum latency that your topology gives you. So you design a topology, and that topology, uh, based on the design and implementation choices you have, bounds your latency. You cannot go below that, basically. For example, if you design a mesh topology, your average latency, depending on the pattern, cannot be below some number over here. Regardless of whatever you do 
with that topology because mesh has clearly some connectivity, right? It has uh, links between neighbors. So you have to actually go through each neighbor to get somewhere. Whereas if you design a point-to-point -to -point topology, your latency, minimum latency is probably much lower, right? Assuming you can implement it currently, assuming you can implement the point-to-point. -point. Okay, so there's some minimum latency bound given by the topology. But topology is not just, uh, once you design topology, you also need to design a routing algorithm to route the packets on top of that topology, right? That bounds your latency. So clearly there's some overhead of your routing algorithm that comes. It takes time. And depending on the different routing algorithm, you may be minimal, non-minimal. If you're non-minimal, for example, if you do deflection routing, you can actually route around the congestion. As a result, your latencies may increase. So basically there's some bound over here also. And then on top of this, there's flow control. There's a flow control method that you employ. You may actually have buffers. You may not have buffers. You may have, if you have buffers, you may have different kinds of credit mechanisms. So buffer sizing matters. And that also bounds your latency. So basically, in the end, topology, routing, and flow control progressively increase your minimum latency to the level that's called zero load latency. So zero load latency is basically you don't have contention in the network what kind of latencies you're getting for a given application or for a given traffic pattern. So that's the minimum bound, as you can see over here. Hopefully that makes sense. On the other side, on the right side, you have a maximum throughput given by topology. Again, topology, topology is the first place to start. You, you design a topology. You, have, you basically determine the size of your links, et cetera. And then that determines what's the maximum throughput that you can get. So maximum throughput is going to be basically where uh, your latency asymptotes. But uh, topology is not the only thing. A uh, routing algorithm adds some inefficiency to the throughput that you can get because as you... Uh, as you put more load into the network, your routing algorithm becomes much more important, clearly. And as a result, it affects uh, uh, how, much, uh, how much link utilization you have. For example, if you do deflection routing, you actually increase the utilization on the links significantly. Versus if you do buffering, uh, this maximum throughput actually goes uh, to the right side because you have a lot more buffers to ingest uh, 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 the, the new packets that you're injecting into the network. So basically... What, what kind of routing that you do uh, matters? Well, I kind of include buffering over here also, but flow control and buffering also uh, determines your saturation throughput. Basically, all of the choices that you make in the network design uh, progressively push you to the left. Uh, you start with a topology that may be very good, but your routing algorithm uh, essentially always reduces some efficiency. Uh, and also, in the end, flow control and buffering also reduce the efficiency. And then you end up with a, a, an asymptote that's called saturation throughput. Essentially, saturation throughput is the injection rate or the load uh, at which the latency asymptotes, as you can see over there. Hopefully that makes sense. So these are the two major metrics of a network in general for a given application. What is the saturation throughput and what is the zero load latency? And you can think of zero load latency as latency with no contention. Because even over here, it's almost zero load, right? If you look at it, if you don't have contention, it's zero load in the end. Does that make sense? So you can examine all networks. Based, so you can take a traffic pattern uh, and you can examine all networks this way, basically. And people have done this. This is actually a nice way of thinking about it. Uh, and people actually created synthetic traffic patterns. For example, nearest neighbor traffic is one pattern, right? You always send a packet uh, to your nearest neighbor. It could be multiple nearest neighbors. That may not be that bad of a traffic pattern, clearly. Uh, uh, another pattern could be uniform random. People have used this. The uniform random tends to be actually a heavy pattern. Uh, the idea is basically each node uniformly, randomly selects another node in the entire network and sends a packet to it at an injection rate that's determined by the x-axis level, clearly. So that's a uniform random packet. Clearly, that creates a lot of load on the entire network. So if you look at the curve for a uniform random pattern, the curve looks like this. Maybe it saturates much earlier. For example, uh, whereas it, it looks maybe like this for a nearest neighbor pattern, right? Because nearest neighbor doesn't increase a lot, uh, put a lot of load on the entire network. But again, it depends on the topology a lot. Okay, so ideal latency, I'll go through these relatively quickly. These are some, uh, again, uh, some uh, terminology, but ideal latency is solely due to the wire delay between the source and destination. But that's not the only thing that uh, it happens clearly. And this also depends on your routing algorithm. Usually, ideal latency is calculated assuming Manhattan distance between two nodes, two points. It's essentially the uh, Manhattan distance are, is, is measured along axes at right angles. 
it's really uh, from Manhattan, right? If you look at the Manhattan uh, street map, it's like a grid, right? And you can actually uh, traverse, if you want to go, and go from, uh, let's say, point A to point B, uh, uh, I don't know, from the financial district to uh, Upper West Side, for example. If you want to do that, you actually go uh, route up north first, and then uh, one, uh, route up uh, on one uh, XY direction, going from uh, lower to higher. And then you uh, route uh, uh, from the, uh, well, not the XY direction, you route from the Y direction, go from lower to higher, and then you go from the X direction, go from right to left, right? That's how you do it, basically. Uh, this is assuming that you cannot route in some other way, of course, right? Which is, I guess, reasonable in that sort of network where you're, you're, you're like a grid. Okay, and then there's some fundamental propagation velocity and then packet size and the channel bandwidth. You can look at these. But of course, clearly, dedicated wiring is impractical, impractical and you have some routers and you, you add some routers. Once you add some routers, you have some router latency, clearly. And then there's some latency due to contention, which is not expressed much over here. So there's additional router latency times the number of hops. And then there's some additional latency uh, due to contention that may happen in any of those routers. Uh, so basically, your actual latency increases significantly. It's not the ideal latency, clearly. But if, you're, if contention doesn't happen, you're, uh, this is the zero load latency, if you will, with some assumptions, of course. Okay, as a result, you get the load latency curve. So this is one example of way of looking at it. People look at, as I said, injected load in terms of uh, packets per cycle per node. That's one way of looking at it. Or there's another way of uh, looking at it, fraction of capacity. You can actually calculate how many things you can inject into a network based on the buffering and the link capacity that you have. And you can say, you can call that 100%. Uh, and you can see what fraction of that is utilized uh, and at what fraction you will get the saturation throughput. So here you get it at 75% or so, which is pretty good actually. In some traffic patterns, you may actually uh, have injected load at only uh, 10% and you may also already be saturated. Again, this depends on the traffic pattern as well as the network as we will see in a couple of examples soon. So these are some real examples from a paper that we had written about 13 years ago. I will mention that later on also, uh, where we examine a bunch of different topologies, right? Mesh, concentrated mesh. Uh, you can read this paper. I'm not going to go through different uh, topologies, but flattened butterfly. We remember, remember that we, we looked at the butterfly topology. Flattened butterfly is basically a version of this butterfly topology uh, designed for on-chip networks. Because if you just take the butterfly topology, it doesn't work very well. So people have designed flattened butterfly topology. Mix is something we have designed, multi-drop express channels. I'm going to briefly mention that later on. But you can see that these are different traffic patterns, bit complement traffic, uniform random traffic, transpose traffic. Uh, and these are the load latency graphs for 64 node uh, networks. This is for 256 node networks for different topologies. And you can see that uh, there, there are different trade-offs in these topologies. And the purpose of this paper is actually look at those trade-offs and design a much more efficient topology. In the end, we were not completely successful because there's a trade-off between efficiency and air, uh, uh, efficiency and performance. But you can see that, for example, here, uh, the, uh, the injection rate, uh, rates are pretty low and uh, almost all of the networks saturate. This is a particularly bad traffic. It's called transpose traffic. Uh, I think transpose, if I remember correctly, uh, don't, call me, uh, don't call me on it, but you can, you can read the books. Uh, I believe uh, if, if your node XY, you send a message to YX. I believe that's it, but I may be wrong <laughs> because these are defined in different ways. You can read the paper also. Uh, uniform random we discussed, and then there's bit complement you can also read about. But you can see that different topologies are good at different traffics. For example, here, uh, this is a mesh. Mesh turns out it starts with a very high zero load latency, but it's saturated in the throughput is higher. So it can, uh, it can actually satisfy a higher saturation throughput. And you can say that, okay, who cares about these traffics? And that's a very good question to ask, basically. Who really cares about it? In the end, you care about applications running on these systems. And that's actually an important thing to uh, think about because uh, uh, it is true that a lot of people analyze networks this way uh, with some different traffics. But in the end, what kind of insight does it give you? I would argue that it's not, it's interesting, but in the end, you want to design the network for your workload that's running. And you really want to know what is the end-to-end -end latency of, uh, not even a latency, what is the performance that I get from a network? How, how fast does it execute my workload, right? And that has been our argument in many of our works as we will discuss uh, in a little bit. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Okay, so these are some topologies. Uh, concentrated mesh is like, like a mesh, but it actually concentrates multiple nodes, uh, multiple different, let's say, uh, cores in a single uh, router. Let's say, yeah, basically it's a four constant, four way concentrated mesh. There are four cores injecting into the same router in this particular case. Flat and butterfly looks like this. Multi drop express channel looks like this. So these are actually express topologies in the sense that here the connections are only local, right? You can see that the links are only to the neighbors. Here, that's not the case. You, you, you're connected to this neighbor, this neighbor, as well as this neighbor. Well, they're not neighbors anymore, right? Basically, but they become neighbors because you have links to them, direct links to them. So these have direct links. Essentially, this topology, this, uh, this concentrated uh, four cores have a direct link to here, as well as here, as well as here. So it's a single hop. Of course, wire latencies may be different, right? Uh, because the wires are longer. That's true for MEX also, except MEX is a little bit cheaper because it doesn't have completely dedicated wires. It basically has a single wire spanning all of these, and it basically have, has drops along the way uh, to these different uh, pieces. And we will see that later on. So MEX is actually simpler than flattened butterfly. As a result, you can actually play a lot of tricks. Okay. Any questions? You can see that people are actually still working on topologies. This is actually an interesting area. Uh, the difficulty in general is how do you... Uh, lay out uh, uh, your wires and routers, uh, because as you get more complex, like we discussed hypercubes last time, right? Hypercubes are very, very difficult to lay out in two-dimensional space. This is much easier to uh, lay out, and this is also much easier to lay out. And clearly, this is obviously uh, very local, right? So the, the problem with the local topologies, like clearly uh, we have discussed uh, kind of last time, is your latency increases, right? Uh, your local, to get from here to here, you have to go through three hops. Whereas here, it's just one hop, right? You have a direct connection to this. And you have a, you, you, from here to here, you have one hop. And from here to here, you have two hops total. So basically, this, uh, this network has a, two, a diameter of two. Maximum, maximum number of hops to get from one, any node to any other node is two. So clearly, there's a benefit to this sort of topology at the expense of complexity. OK. Okay, and these are some of the readings that you may want to do. Uh, they're not required, but you can take a look at them. I'm going to mention this also if you have time at the end, but basically using a combination of topology, routing, flow control, everything that we've discussed, you can design a network that scales well and provides also service guarantees. This is a complicated, very complicated paper, actually. I'll try to uh, divide it down into, uh, let's say, small pieces, if you will. But basically, if you really understand uh, what you can do with the topology, you can actually simplify your router, for example. We're going to argue that in this work. Uh, you can, in, instead of having quality of service, for example, in all of your routers, some of the quality of service comes from the fact that you have a topology that can provide direct links uh, and use those direct links so that you avoid congestion, basically. That's the idea. So this is the interesting part, in my opinion, in, uh, in the system design using networks. You, you have a lot of freedom of choice. It's not just, oh, I have to solve everything using routing. That's not true. You, have to, you can actually uh, redesign the topology if you have the freedom to do that so that you can make your router simple. And uh, also rethink your, how to make your router simple by rethinking the flow control and buffering, for example. Okay. Okay. And then there's another version of it that's short. Uh, let's talk about network performance metrics. We've kind of talk, talked about these already, but packet latency clearly is one. Uh, this is at the packet level. Uh, there's also round trip latency. This is request reply latency. This is becoming a bit more interesting, basically. How long does it take for my cache miss, for example, to get serviced in the end? Uh, this could be, again, average, maximum. We can basically have a lot of statistics on these. Saturation throughput, we discussed that. Uh, but uh, as we discussed, uh, these metrics are also interesting. But again, uh, just like the workloads, these metrics don't really get to the heart of what you're trying to optimize. Right? In the end, what you're really trying to optimize is application-level performance, which is the execution time of an application. or some system performance, which consists of many applications or multiple applications, which is job throughput. Which, and this is clearly affected by the interference, as we have discussed in earlier lectures, right, when we talk about memory controllers. So keep in mind that these are the really important things. These can give you some indications of how your network is performing and potentially how that could affect your applications, but these cannot replace uh, the application-level performance metrics. And if you look at the uh, vast literature in interconnection networks and networking, you will see a lot of focus on this one. And uh, it's good to basically be, uh, do some constructive criticism and say, is that really right? right? And 
uh, you will see that that's not actually the case. I mean, some papers that we have assigned uh, show that that's not the case. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk, uh, talk about several works that actually try to optimize for application level performance and system efficiency, as opposed to these metrics over here. Okay, this is interesting because uh, it's, it's important to really get your metrics right uh, to begin with, right? Otherwise, you may come up with a completely different topology and a routing algorithm that's not very useful for the application that you're running. This is true in essentially every system design choice, but for some reason, this area, networking area, has developed uh, historically in such a way that people focused on the network level metrics and not system level metrics, partly because networks are huge. And if you really want to focus on a system level metric, uh, you will need to run an application on a huge network, right? And how do you do that? It's very difficult. Think about the internet in 1960s, right? People were proposing different designs, 60s, 70s, 80s. And how do you actually simulate applications? You don't even know what an application is right, at that point in time. So it's a lot easier to focus on these metrics. <laughs> but I think as you move into on-chip networks and uh, multi-core and supercomputers, and as, as the computing power becomes better in terms of the way we simulate these things, it's, it becomes easier to gather these application level metrics. As a result, it, it, becomes more, it makes more sense to focus on these. I'm not suggesting that in the past, focusing on this was the right thing to do. It's, it's always good to uh, match these with the characteristics of the applications, basically. That's what people were doing also, right? People are trying to do, uh, okay, these are the latencies in these synthetic traffics that I would get, and my application kind of resembles the synthetic traffic. It's a bit hard, of course, right? Because an application actually is very heterogeneous. There are many different types of traffic it exercises at the same time. Uh, so that has limitations in the end. That's why, that's why simulation and simulation of large networks, uh, the, the, the ability to be uh, uh, that, uh, our ability to be able to do that efficiently today has enabled us to focus more on application level performance and system performance. Okay, there are no questions. I'll keep, yes, please, please use that. <laughs> Um, I noticed that uh, the network nodes have your pictures and cheat equally, like um, one um, length buffer for each node. But in real case, like such uh, indicate for a memory bank or indicate for a processor unit, they process data in different speed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if the router algorithm also take care of like which node it is connecting. Yeah, it, you can certainly specialize the routing uh, for the node it's connected to. Yeah, I'm going to not talk about that as much, but yes, in real systems, you can specialize, for example, if one node injects a lot, uh, you can specialize the router for that node frequency, for example, uh, but also maybe they custom, customize their algorithm. It becomes difficult, of course, whenever you add heterogeneity into the system, it becomes uh, more complicated. Now you need, to, you need to take into account different needs. But for example, if you have a CPU versus GPU, running on the same network and the GPU's injection rate into, this, uh, into the network is a lot higher, you may want to design a heterogeneous router or routers spe specialized for different accelerators or multiple networks as we will also discuss. <laughs> so people have also thought about multiple networks and in the Tylera design we talked about last time, they had multiple different networks, right? In that case, they didn't have heterogeneity but they had multiple networks because of different, different types of traffic. Yeah, but that's a very good question basically. Whenever you're, uh, whenever your communication pattern is significantly different, you may want to consider different networks uh, for that communication pattern. But again, of course, uh, the cost is high. Okay, so we're going to talk about on-chip networks. I'm going to first introduce uh, what's different in on-chip networks. But basically, on-chip networks are on a chip, single chip, uh, and they connect cores, caches, memory controllers, etc. Whatever needs to be connected on the same chip. And this is one common way of uh, thinking about on-chip networks, clearly it has a two-dimensional mesh topology, which is commonly used. It's usually packet switched, but again, there are reasons for circuit switching as we discussed. In fact, one of Tyler has five networks was circuit switched. Usually uh, XY routing, which is because it's simple with FIFO and route drop-in port arbitration in the router is common. FIFO and round drop-in are simpler, clearly, right? You go through the virtual channels and you figure out which one is the first one that came and then schedule that one first or you do a round robin across the virtual channels. Uh, for a given output port, you decide which virtual channel sends the packet based on that algorithm. Right? And virtual channel buffering is common, basically. So this was kind of the state of the art in 2000s, uh, early 2000s, for example, as we will discuss. But these networks are primarily serving cache misses and memory requests. But as we discussed, these processing elements could be different, clearly, right? 
Okay, that's another example. Uh, we've already designed this router last time. I will not go into the details. I mean, clearly we didn't go into every single thing in this router. Modern routers are actually much, very sophisticated. Uh, so buffering, for example, uh, you, have, you clearly have lots of buffers and you have control logic and allocation. There's a lot of speculation employed in the routers also because uh, there's a pipeline in the router basically. And if you don't employ speculation in the router, your latency increases significantly because you, uh, some of these uh, things are dependent on each other and you need to speculate in the router so that you can basically you can assume that you get the port allocated and then you actually start sending the uh, control packet earlier so that you can actually do the arbitration the next arbitration for something else because there's a there's an arbitration for the virtual channel in the next uh, router there's also an arbitration for the switch over here and you want to parallelize as much as possible in a modern router so modern routers actually employ a lot of speculation that's something we did not discuss and i'm not going to discuss because we don't have time uh, to discuss that but keep that in mind this is a very heavily pipeline router in the end so there's a lot of complexity because of that also uh, because you want to reduce latency you employ a lot of speculation. When, you, when the speculation is wrong, for example, you assume that uh, this particular uh, packet will be allocated a switch, but it didn't get allocated the switch because someone else over here got allocated the switch. Then you need, to, you need to have a mechanism of detecting that and replaying it, meaning rescheduling this packet over here, right? Yeah. So uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, people want to minimize the complexity in the router as much as possible. And we're going to talk about some works that try to uh, reduce the complexity. So the complexity of the router is actually not uh, something that's uh, really interesting, but it's quite complex today. But before we go into it, let's talk about differences between on-chip versus off-chip. Uh, so there are some advantages of being on-chip. Clearly, there's low latency because you don't span distances uh, like the, across the data center, for example, right? Uh, there's no pin constraints. That's a huge difference, actually, because when you actually want to connect one computer to another computer in a supercomputer, you're constrained by the pins, basically output communication. How do, you, how do you get the message out of the chip? And that's usually constrained by the pins and that's expensive. You're limited by how many pins you can have. And we've discussed this many times in this uh, course, pins are very costly, right? DRAM design is dominated by pins, for example. You cannot add more pins to DRAM because it's increased the cost significantly. That's true over here as well. But uh, the, uh, um, the, the, well, the true part is basically that's true for off-chip, but that's not true for on-chip. So on-chip, you can actually design a topology that's not constrained as much by pins. Uh, you have rich and low-power wiring resources. That's actually very good, but there are some downsides also, as we will see, related to wiring resources. Uh, this, this is not true, actually, for off-chip, because off-chip interconnects are actually very power-hungry. Uh, they span longer distances also. But on-chip, uh, on you can have very high bandwidth. And you can also have simpler global coordination because you're limited by the die size, right? Ideally, uh, if, if you have a huge network, uh, you try to avoid global coordination mechanisms, as we discussed in the last lecture, right? You do global synchronization, for, uh, for example. How do you do that? People have designed actually very specialized networks for that, but clearly those networks are not very scalable. On-chip, you eliminate that problem. Basically. If you want to synchronize among the cores on-chip, you can, you can be much more simple. But there are some constraints also. You clearly have the two-dimensional substrate. As we discussed, this limits the easy to implement topologies. And energy and power consumption becomes a key concern because modern chips are already limited by uh, total design power. So if you keep adding more complexity to your routers, for example, more complex algorithms, large buffers, you basically increase the power consumption. And even though there's rich and low power wiring resources, those wiring resources are not completely free for you in the sense that you have, you're limited by what is left by the logic area because you cannot wire everything clearly. There's logic around you also that could consume multiple layers. And then you have limited metal layers, basically. They constrain the uh, wiring resources, how you use the wiring resources. So let's take a look at these a little bit more. So cost, if you look at off-chip, in general, cost is about pins, connectors, cables, and channels. Whereas on-chip, it's really about storage, buffering, and switches. Wires are, in general, plentiful. So this leads to networks with many white channels on chip and less buffering. And we're going to talk about this buffering a little bit more. So channel characteristics on chip, you have short distance or so low latency. Uh, and, uh, but you need some repeaters because of the RC lines. But off chip, it's basically huge distances. And workloads are also very different. Usually off chip networks are specialized for large scale parallel application, multi-chip traffic, supercomputers in general. Of course, you can think about the net, uh, internet as well, but usually supercomputers. Uh, whereas on chip, it's a limited fraction of that, right? It's, a, it's usually multi-core cache and memory traffic. 
clearly these things need to be combined, right? If you want to have a scalable workload, you need to have on-chip networks as well as on-chip off-chip networks. And how do you co-design them becomes interesting as well. So this is a, a paper that has uh, introduced uh, on-chip networks. Uh, I would I recommend reading it. It's it's probably on our reading list. I don't remember actually. If it's not, we should add it. Uh, Geraldo, can you remember? <laughs> and this is a bonus, clearly. Uh, but basically, it's it argued for uh, using packets as opposed to wires. Basically, instead of doing dedicated wiring between different components uh, on chip, we should have packet-based networks. So this clearly argues for a particular type of network, packet-based network, where you have routers uh, that route packets across as opposed to have dedicated wire. And you can read the paper. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, uh, but this uh, what I've, I've summarized already uh, what this paper talks about. So there are interesting questions that it poses. This enabled a lot of research uh, in the on-chip networking. Uh, what topologies are interesting? Uh, what flow control met methods are interesting? Uh, this is something that we are talking about. What flow control methods, what buffering is interesting? Because a lot of people actually somehow looked at the topologies after this work, but not many people looked at the buffering. And we, look, we, uh, we looked at uh, the buffering in my group, and it's actually very interesting, as we will see. And then what circuits are interesting. So there are many, many interesting things over here, which I'm not going to talk about right now. So this paper uh, looks into uh, some differences from off-chip networks from a kind of a local a supercomputer perspective. But we also looked at it from a uh, networking perspective, like uh, what happens if you actually compare the phenomena that appear on internet versus on-chip networks. And this is a paper that we have written. This is the top networking conference. I believe this is still the only paper that appeared in a top networking conference that talks about on-chip networks. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing how these communities are so divided, right? Uh, these people write a lot of papers on networking issues like internet, and they talk a lot about congestion control, for example, but they don't really normally take, uh, like say, other, other works that uh, are out in the field that are about networking also, but in a very different way with very different trade-offs. So we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, okay. Okay, now let's focus on uh, routers a little bit. So I'm going to go a little bit more into router design uh, and be a little bit more specific. And we're going to talk about buffers uh, because this is actually uh, some fundamental decision that you have to make uh, in your uh, design of a, buff uh, of a router. How much buffering do, do you have? Uh, how much buffering do you really need? And how do you design that buffer? And how do you design the algorithms to manage that buffer? And this really affects a lot of things as we will see uh, in, in terms of uh, evaluating numbers also. So, Buffers are clearly necessary for high network throughput, as we discussed, right? Your saturation throughput increases with buffers just like this. So this is, uh, even though this is uh, this doesn't have any numbers on it, this is actually real in many uh, uh, in many traffic patterns, in many workloads. As you increase the buffers, you actually get higher saturation throughput, and uh, your packet latencies are tamed for a longer time, if you will, if you have large buffers, because you have more capacity to to ingest, as we discussed, right? If you have buffers, if you keep injecting into the network. If you don't have enough buffers, what will happen? Basically, you'll saturate, right? You will not be able to inject into the network if you think about it. But if you have a lot of buffers, you could keep injecting into the network. It's basically the router's problem to handle how to schedule things out of that buffer in the end. So that's the fundamental thing with buffers. So that's good. But unfortunately, buffers have a lot of, as we discussed, uh, consume energy and power, uh, especially the dynamic energy when you read and write. If you could eliminate that, you could eliminate dynamic energy. If you could eliminate buffers, you could also eliminate static energy because even when you're not using the buffers, you may actually size your buffers for some worst case pattern, but most of the time you won't be using the buffers in that case, and you would still be consuming dynamic and static energy. They add complexity and latency, as we have seen, uh, logic for buffer management, virtual channel allocation, and some sort of flow control. Usually it's credit-based, as we discussed. <laughs> Uh, and also the buffers themselves, right, add complexity. Uh, and then they require significant chip area. There have been prototypes, uh, uh, for example, in a particular prototype in 2000s, early 2000s, these folks showed that input buffers occupy 75% of the total on-chip network area. I believe that's an overestimate. It's real. It's from a real chip. But I don't believe that the buffers were very optimized in their design. That's why you get 75%. So it depends on how you design the buffers, right? If you actually use, use optimized SRAM, logic in your buffers, then you actually get a lower number than 75%, maybe 30%, 40%. It's still significant, but lower than 75%. If you actually use uh, what you would use like flip-flops or registers, uh, then you may actually get to 75%. These folks use flip-flops, for example. So it basically depends on what kind of logic uh, gate you use in the end. 
So the question we asked was basically, uh, let's be a contrarian and let's say, can we actually get rid of these buffers because they cause a lot of headaches clearly in our systems and overhead in our systems. So of course, uh, how much throughput we lose becomes interesting, right? Uh, so there's some injection rate. If you go no buffers, there's some distance. In real workloads, how much does this affect? Basically, the realistic scenarios are what was what, what was interesting to us because clearly, if you look at uniform random traffic, okay, maybe not so good, right? But we're not talking about uniform random traffic. We're talking about real applications that's executing on a multi-core system. Then the question becomes interesting, right? Let's re-examine this buffering concept when you when you have realistic scenarios, and maybe there are some realistic scenarios in which. This is okay, basically, right? You never inject a lot into the network. And that's what, what we found, actually. Because of the caching mechanisms that you have in existing systems, you don't inject a whole lot into the network. So networks are usually over provisioned And later works, actually, that came after ours also showed that. And there were some prior works that kind of showed that, but that they didn't emphasize it uh, to uh, change the design decisions in the network. So this is interesting, basically. The question is basically, uh, in, uh, if you look at just uh, the traffic, uh, synthetic traffic, maybe that's not a good idea. But if you look at real applications, maybe this may become a good idea. That's why it's interesting to look at that. So these are slides from my collaborator, Thomas Moshibroda, who was an ETH alumnus, actually. Uh, he did his PhD here. He got the ETH medal for uh, the, uh, the, the work that he did with Roger, Roger Watanoffer in the ETH department. Uh, we were uh, colleagues in, at Microsoft Research here right, one week after uh, I arrived at Microsoft Research and we started talking, okay, what can we solve uh, important problems in multi-core systems? And this is one of the first, this is not one of the first, no. This is one of the works that we did. Okay, uh, so basically, can we achieve energy reduction and can we reduce area and complexity? These are actually interesting questions, basically. And the work that uh, you're going to read as part of your homework is answering some of these questions. And you go back to the fundamentals in the end, right? The question is, how do you actually get rid of buffers? You either drop packets, we basically said, okay, maybe dropping packets is not that great because it increases complexity even more. But if you actually deflect packets, uh, do uh, um, hot potato routing, deflection routing, like we discussed last time, maybe that actually gets you to a much better place in terms of complexity. And maybe it's okay because now you can route around congestion. Right? Whenever you drop a packet, when you're congested, you're actually adding a lot of latency. But if you're congested, if you're contention on one of the links, and if you route the packet, misroute the packet a little bit, you're not adding a lot of latency. You're just adding a little bit latency so that this packet routes around this congested area, basically. That's the idea. So that's the reason why we want, we, uh, we wide for deflection. Uh, I believe in the end, it may be good to look at a combination of buffering, deflection, and dropping. Dropping be happening at the very, very, let's say, uh, dro dropping maybe comes to the rescue at the very difficult cases that you cannot handle with deflection uh, and buffering. Okay, so we've already discussed deflection routing very quickly again. If there's no productive direction is available, send a packet to another direction that it doesn't want to go to. And we said that this was actually a very old idea, as you can see, right? So basically, two packets want to go through that. One of them gets the output port. Uh, okay, this is the buffered. Uh, the other one gets buffered in the buffered, uh, buffered uh, in the buffered on-chip network. But in Bless, the idea is one of them takes the output port gets prioritized, the other one gets deflected somewhere else. And eventually, hopefully, it comes back. We're going to talk about that, hopefully, because that actually adds complexity to the router. Now, not necessarily comes back to this router, but comes back, goes to its destination, right, eventually. Makes sense, right? It's a beautiful idea, I think. It's like a hot potato. It, the, the, the pack is a hot potato. Nobody can hold it. Everybody has to throw it to someone. If, if I gave you a hot potato over here, you have to throw it to someone else, basically. Okay, so basically, our hope was this, basically. You have this router that's pretty complicated. We want to get rid of that. And we want to get rid of all of the logic associated with that as much as possible. And uh, we basically replaced the routing logic with some sort of arbitration policy, uh, which consists of two things. You can read the paper for more detail. But basically, you rank the flits and create a ranking. And this ranking is important for live lock. We will discuss that you have to do oldest first ranking. You have to have, form a total order across flits. And for a given flit in this ranking, you find the best free output port and apply to each flip in order of rank. We will see that this is actually expensive. I'm going to go through this in more detail. But assuming you can do that, uh, essentially, each split is routed independently. This is a bit of a difference from a wormhole routing. We have a way of adapting wormhole to bufferless, but it's a huge headache. So if you read the paper, you may not be able to understand it, but it's a huge headache, basically. Uh, so all the, it's all this first arbitration because this is necessary for live lock freedom. 
Uh, and we will talk about that more. So I'm, I will defer that discussion. So network topology is interesting because bufferless routing, pure deflection routing, cannot be applied to every topology. Uh, this is where topology and routing fundamentally is very interesting, for example. It can be applied to most topologies. Basically, number of output ports, I don't know why this, what's going on here, but number of output ports needs to be greater than equal to number of input ports. That's a greater than equal to sign, even though that may not look like it <laughs> at every router. I mean, clearly this is the case, right? If your number of output ports is smaller than number of input ports, then you cannot deflect. If you deflect uh, something, where does it go, right? It has to maybe go back in the same port, but essentially that's an output port at that point. And also every router needs to be reachable from every other router. So this is also important, especially for fault tolerance. So there, uh, there are works that actually look at fault tolerance with deflection routing, which I'm not going to talk about, but it's very interesting. So flow control injection policy is now completely local. You inject to a router whenever an input port is free. That hopefully makes sense, right? You don't, you don't look at the buffer availability. You just basically sense the input ports and you inject to a router if an input port is free. Hopefully that makes sense. So now this has uh, no deadlock because every flit is always moving. So deadlock is gone because you, have, you don't uh, Y for buffers. This is buffer level deadlock, not protocol level deadlock. There's a higher level deadlock that we will see that exists. Uh, because there needs to be some buffering somewhere else, as we will see later on. And there's no live lock because we use oldest first ranking. So we're going to revisit uh, the live lock later and the deadlock, protocol level deadlock especially. So this is in one slide, the summary of bufferless versus buffered routing, bufferless with deflection, right? The advantages of buffers, no buffers, purely local flow control. It's simple. You don't need to deal with all of the headaches like passing credits, communicating buffer availability. There are no, there's no need for virtual channels, clearly. Buffers are gone. And the router design is simplified. And no deadlocks and live locks, assuming you do the right thing. And there's adaptivity. So the, the big advantage of bufferless is whenever you have congestion, packets are deflected around congested areas. Now, if you have lots of congestion, then there's lots of deflection in the routers. As a result, all of the packets are circling around in the network. Now, uh, live lock freedom, of course, makes make sure that packets are reaching their destinations, but they may be reaching their destinations very, very slowly, meaning you may be operating right here, right? So basically, you've, uh, all of your links are busy. Clearly, there are no buffers. And there's a lot of deflection. As a result, your saturation throughput uh, is here, and your latencies have sh shot, up, uh, shot up. OK. OK. So there's also router latency reduction. We're going to get back to that. We were very optimistic in this original paper. This is a bit tough, but we will see that later on. And then there's area savings. But of course, disadvantages are increased latency, especially when congestion happens, reduced bandwidth, uh, increased buffering at receiver. So you need to, uh, and now what happens is different flits from a single packet get reordered inside the network. If you think about wormhole routing, we said wormhole routing, a single packet gets divided into head, body, and flit. There's a clear ordering within a packet, and that ordering is obeyed by every single router. So flit head packet will, a head flit will arrive at the destination first, and then body will come, and then the tail will come in a particular order. With bufferless, that's not the case anymore. Basically, packets, uh, different flits from a packet can arrive in any order. Right? Now, this complicates the buffering at the receiver, actually. You need to have some increased buffering, and we're going to look at that problem also. So uh, one of the criticisms of this sort of eliminating buffers inside the network is that, oh, now you're pushing the problem somewhere else. Right? You need buffers outside the network. And that's true, but we're going to look at that uh, a few years later soon. So hold that a little bit. If you have any thoughts, please uh, uh, chime in. So there's header information at each flit. Clearly, there's no head, body, uh, and a tail anymore. Every flit is independent. And all this first arbitration is definitely complex. That's true. And we will see actually this uh, later on. And quality of service also becomes difficult uh, because now uh, every flit is routed independently. But this is actually uh, something that people have tackled later on. OK, so let me talk about uh, router. Uh, so let's talk about some uh, results uh, quickly over here. This is uniform random traffic. Clearly, this is bad news, right? If you look at this minimal adaptive routing, uh, it's a minimal adaptive routing mechanism. It's not even a non-minimal mechanism, but basically, it looks quite good, right? At, uh, it has high saturation proof, but reasonably low latency. If you look at less bufferless, it's actually not bad in terms of latency, but its latencies increase quickly, and its saturation throughput is much lower. So it doesn't sound good initially. But that's 
not real life. <laughs> well, well, that's synthetic life. Real life looks like this, basically, and it doesn't look bad, basically. So the takeaway is this is performance, and they all look similar. Maybe bufferless is actually a little bit worse in some cases, but in some cases, it's better if you actually reduce the latency of the buffering. If you can somehow make your router much more simpler and reduce the latency from two cycles to one cycle, it actually becomes better than buffer design. We were a bit aggressive. This is actually, it's always good to, as I, as I mentioned earlier in uh, some lectures, whenever you're doing research, it's always good to uh, check the extremes. This extreme design decision, what can it teach you, right? Okay, going completely buffer, this is extreme clearly. And let's take a look at it because everyone is looking at buffered. Why not take a look at bufferless? Okay. Okay, there's a lot of here, but we use perfect caches to actually exercise the network. If you actually use imperfect caches, packets wait in the memory controller. So as a result, the network doesn't get utilized that much. That's why perfect caches actually induce a lot more traffic on the network. And you can see that there's very little performance degradation. And yeah, even performance improvement, if you can reduce the latency using uh, the deflection routing. Okay, and then the energy reduction is also significant, as you can see. Uh, so this breaks down the network into buffer energy, link energy, and router energy. Uh, and you can see that the buffer energy is significantly reduced. There's still some buffering that needs to happen in the, um, in the pipeline buffers. Uh, so what we are doing with, uh, so it's better to look at this one because this is a bit more uh, dense uh, network in terms of uh, how, much, uh, uh, how much links are utilized. But basically, you can see that buffer energy gets reduced. Link energy increases because what's happening is a trade-off is you're eliminating buffers, but you're utilizing the links more. Because buffers are eliminated, packets are circling around the links. Links are used as buffers, essentially, if you think about this. But there are significant energy savings. OK, so basically, the takeaway in a real system, real application is injection rates are not extremely high in real systems because the system is, uh, it's, um, so what happened, there are two reasons for this. One is locality in the caches, because only cache misses go out of the network. If it hits in your local cache, you don't send it on the network. So that filters some of the requests. And then the sources are not always injecting, right? It's not uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a processor when you're running a real workload. After some point, the processor stalls. We talked about these stalls in many lectures, right? And we wanted to eliminate them, but we cannot eliminate them. The processor stalls. What does that mean? The processor cannot keep injecting forever. Whereas these traffic patterns that are used in networking in general assume that the source keeps injecting forever, <laughs> meaning there is no self-throttling effect. So basically, there's a lot of self-throttling going on in a, uh, in a real system. The core stops injecting at some point because it's waiting for responses and it doesn't have anything else to uh, go with. Okay, I mean, we've already discussed this for essentially worse than temporary hotspots, you use network links as buffers uh, to avoid congested areas, let's say. Okay, these were our conclusions. Uh, I think I've given you a lot of these significant energy savings, area savings of 60%. That's what we showed. We were optimistic again. And simplified router and network design and performance slowdown is minimal. So basically we argued for a very strong case of rethinking the network on chip design. And we said future research should look at many, many different things. And this is a paper, and this is one of the, I think required papers on the homework. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, but as I said, it's not a perfect paper in the sense that it's uh, kind of overlooked some of the issues and deferred them for future work. And now we're going to talk about how to make this real. Right? This may be, okay, a good idea at the high level, but how do you actually make it real? As, as we discussed in earlier lectures, uh, everything starts with a good big idea. That big idea may not be immediately implementable, and, but you show the benefits of it, and those benefits uh, motivate making it real into the future, right? So you cannot basically solve all the problems in the world in one paper, let's say. If you're thinking about doing that, forget about it. <laughs> Unless you actually define the problem to be, problem scope to be very small, if you will, such that it's not that big of an idea anymore. Which is also fine. Those actually are papers that also need to be uh, written and shown and uh, word, word improves that way as well. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some issues in bufferless deflection routing. Any questions so far? People are tired <laughs> or everything is clear. Okay, yes, please. Um, in Buffalo's network, you mentioned output ping and input ping mm -hmm. at our router, but does it mean like every node has two input? One well, input, uh, one output? it depends on the topology. Uh, it depends on the topology. For example, in the mesh, uh, you have four neighbors. So you have four outputs and four inputs. 
you can receive a packet from any neighbor and you can send the packet to any other neighbor. If it's a ring, it's uh, only our nearest neighbor, right? If it's a single ring. <laughs> yeah. so kind of like separate one node every uh, um, buffer into as in the buffless one. Uh, say it again, I didn't understand that. Yeah, uh, in the buffless network, you kind of duplicate every uh, node in the buffer one. Or, but in the topology with buffer. No, no, the topology is the same. You don't duplicate anything. It's just you remove the buffers. And whenever you send uh, a packet to an output node, instead of putting it into a buffer, if, it's, if somebody else is using that output node, you send it to another link. Have one output and one input flit, right? You use the word. No, no, okay. Flit, flit is a piece of the packet. So consider these two flits. One of them goes, one of them is buffered in the baseline. And in this case, one of them wins the arbitration. Okay, I should wait for the animation to go. One of them wins the arbitration, the other one goes here. But there could be multiple flits at the same time doing that. This is just an example of two flits contending for one output node. Okay. Okay, so there are basically a bunch of issues and we're gonna tackle them. Uh, so live lock is very important as we discussed and it actually cause, causes a lot of raw through complexity. So when you actually try to make this really real, these issues become interesting. And then there's performance and congestion at high loads and there course quality of service and fairness. This is still an important area, I think, quality of service and fairness. And there's a book chapter that talks about a lot of these issues. Actually, there's a later one also that we have recently written, but I'm not gonna talk about that one. I'll mention that later. Let's talk about making it low complexity. So I've already uh, said a lot of these. Uh, so basically, uh, there, how do you actually design a router uh, that uh, doesn't have a critical path and doesn't have large reassembly buffers uh, at the end? So basically, uh, our goal is to obtain the benefits of bufferless routing without uh, making the router complicated. So essentially, we want to make this practical. So let's take a look at the problems fundamentally. You must provide live lock freedom. A packet should not be deflected forever. And hopefully it should not be deflected for a long time also, right? There should be some bound on how, many, uh, how, how much latency a packet spends in the network, right? And then there, you need to reassemble packets upon arrival, basically. So th this is the routing unit flit, and then you have multiple, pack, uh, multiple flits consisting of a packet. And you need to reassemble the packet at the end. So let's take a look at the bufferless router at a high level. So essentially, you have some deflection routing logic, uh, assuming a mesh topology again. Uh, so you, can, you have four inputs from four neighbors, uh, and then you have the local node injecting into it. So it's really a five by five uh, router, right? You have four inputs uh, from four neighbors and the local node, and then deflection routing logic determines which outputs uh, actually, uh, which output ports uh, get which packets that are in the inputs. And then there's a crossbar that actually does the switching. Uh, and then uh, one of, uh, there, there are four output ports, as you can see, four neighbors, and then there's a local node. So somebody, somebody can send a message to the local node. This is where you eject. And once you eject, you need to buffer the packet and the reassembly buffers where uh, each flit uh, waits for all of the other flits corresponding to the same packet uh, to come. And after that time, you basically serve it to the processor or wh whatever, right? You could, of course, serve it uh, earlier as well, but you need to keep a lot of uh, bookkeeping uh, if you want to serve things earlier, right? Basically, you need to keep the number of the flit and uh, where it is. Okay, so the first problem is in the deflection routing logic. This is where you need to provide live lag freedom. And the second problem is how big are these packet reassembly buffers? And these are essentially fundamental problems. How do you design the router? How do you design the buffering in the network? Let's take a look at the first one. So you must provide live lag freedom. This is actually not as easy as we suggested earlier, right? Flits are sorted by some sort of age, and then they're assigned in age order to the output port. If two flits go to the same output port, the older one wins. Because that's, we want to make sure that there is some progress guarantee. And this turns out, this is a very long critical path in a buffered router, and we're going to examine the reasons for it soon. And then the second one is you must reassemble packets upon arrival. And uh, for this, reassembly buffers must be side for the worst case. And we will see what that worst case is. Worst case is really every node in the network injecting into the network to a single destination node. And we will see that that could be bad. It could happen, right? It could be a denial of service type of attack in the end, or it could be based on poor data mapping, but there is some worst case. 
Now, either you have a way of handling the worst case or you drop packets, which is a way of handling the worst case, basically. But one way of handling the worst case is make sizing the buffers as large as possible. And this actually has very large buffer sizes. For a small network, like 64 bits, 64 nodes, you get four kilobyte per node. So we eliminate buffers uh, uh, inside the routers, but we push the problem to the outside, basically. It's interesting. Okay, so let's take a look, talk about live lag freedom. So uh, basically, as we discussed earlier, all flits are timestamp based on uh, injection to the network, and all the flits are assigned their desired ports. So there's a total order among flits, basically. This really enables live lag freedom. If you look at the flit age and order all of the flits in the network or coming into the network later on, there's a total order. And there's guaranteed progress for the oldest one, and there's no guaranteed progress for any of them. They may be deflected at some point. New traffic is the lowest priority, clearly. But there's a cost to this, basically, as we will see. So let's take a look at sorting. Essentially, you need to do sorting. If you want to form this sort of total order, you need to do sorting of priorities. Uh, and you need to have some sort of hardware sorting logic. Clearly, you're used to software sorting, but hardware, actually, people have designed sorters in hardware as well. And here, we want to design a sorter that's extremely efficient. Right? And unfortunately, there is no easy way to do this. This is a sorting network. People have actually examined sorting networks, and it goes back to our fundamentals, two by two crossbars. Remember, we looked at two by two crossbars in the last lecture. We're going to design a sorting network, a permutation network, uh, uh, using uh, essentially two by two routers. So essentially, uh, you, want, you need to sort flits by age. You have a long late sort network. There are three comparator stages for four flits. Let's take a look at this. So these are the priorities, four, one, two, three, four being the highest priority, I believe. Uh, and you need to do some sort of sorting. And you can see the sorting is happening right now, right? So in the end, you get one, two, three, four. That's a sorting network. And these could be priorities, as you can see, right? But now it's, just not, it's not just a sorting network because you need to do allocation as well. So if it was just sorting, okay, this is nice. This sorts the flits. But one may not want to go here, right? One may want to go here. It's sorting based on which output port each flit wants. So let's take a look at that now. After sorting, flits are assigned to output ports in priority order. So port assignment of younger flits depends on that of older flits. So after you sort, you know which flits is the highest priority. You can say four is the highest priority or one is the highest priority, depending on how you do the priority numbering, right? Now you need to assign the output ports to them. Now there's a sequential dependence that you introduce. This is one way of designing, uh, the, uh, designing the oldest first arbitration, basically. You need to uh, assign output port, but if you want to assign output port, you basically prioritize the older flit. That means that you don't, you cannot assign output port to a younger flit until the older flit actually gets assigned an output port, right? So there's some fundamental sequential dependence in port allocation. So let's take a look at this. So you've already sorted things, age ordered flits. One is the highest priority. One wants east. Okay, the allocator says you get east, done. Now east is not available. North, south, west is available. Two wants east, too bad, you get deflected. And there's some, there's some decision that makes, oh, you get north based on, based on the topology of the network and the destination that you have and the congestion. So there may be many things that uh, affect which output port this gets assigned. But clearly, it cannot get assigned east. And the way you know that it cannot get assigned is because someone else got assigned east earlier. And then south and west are available. Flit 3 wants south. That's good. It's granted. Now, flit, uh, now only west is available. Flit 4 wants south. Well, too bad. It also gets deflected. You get west. Right? So basically, there is a sequential dependence in this decision making, and that actually increases the, uh, uh, increases the critical path of the route. Now, you can do a lot of parallelization and speculation to actually reduce this. That increases the complexity of the router even more, let's say. You can reduce the latency of this a little bit, but your complexity actually increases. You can say basically, oh, I could make some of these decisions in parallel. I could speculate which one's getting what, and eventually select. This like. Uh, if you design a ripple carry adder, this looks kind of like a ripple carry adder, right? You, uh, the second block of the addition starts only when the carry in the first block is determined. But you can design a carry look ahead adder where you actually assume that you're getting east, or, or assume that the previous decision was east, and then do some calculation. Assume that the previous decision was west, do some calculation. Basically, assume, based on all of those assumptions, do some calculation. And then, based on what really comes out of there, you just select which uh, decision that you make. That's like a carry select adder uh, or carry look ahead adder. 
both of them are actually similar uh, in some way in the design. Uh, but basically, uh, you, can, you, can, you can actually replicate a lot of circuitry over here, do a lot of speculation, and reduce the critical path a little bit uh, with a, a lot of extra complexity. So this is, these are fundamentals of design, clearly, as you can see. Right? But assuming that this is what you do, you don't go into a lot of a huge router, which we we're trying to eliminate to begin with, uh, you get a very long critical path, 43%. And the question we asked was basically, is there a cheaper way to route while guaranteeing lilac freedom? And this actually is very interesting. Any thoughts? Does anybody have any ideas? Basically, uh, what is really necessary for lilac freedom? I guess the top part actually has a side channel in terms of information, but maybe it's not specific enough for giving the idea. So what is really necessary for lilac freedom? We said total order is good. The total order is clearly fine for lilac freedom, but total order is expensive. Anybody? Okay, this is the total order. Just to make you think a little bit. Uh, clearly, this gets guaranteed progress, and no one else gets guaranteed progress. So is, is, is the total order necessary? Kind of a leading question, basically. <laughs> basically, what I just said is the only thing that's necessary, right? I actually said it. You guarantee progress for one flit, and no one else has any guarantee of progress. As long as you, you guarantee the progress of this flit, it reaches destination, and then some other flit gets guaranteed progress, and you keep doing this, that's enough. So basically, pick one flit. It could be random. Prioritize upon arrival, until arrival, and do it consistently across the entire network, clearly, right? If one router prioritizes this flit, if another router prioritizes some other flit, no, that doesn't work. Basically, pick one flit as golden flit. Every router recognizes that that's the highest priority flit and prioritizes it until arrival. Among other flits, you don't care. Why need a total order over here? You don't care, basically. What, what we're trying to do is to be as simple as possible. And I will argue that this is the simplest thing you can do. That's a challenge also for people who <laughs> may be uh, motivated in terms of uh, challenges, right? So basically, partial ordering is sufficient. And this is a big realization here. And then ensure any flit is eventually picked. Once the red flit gets to its destination, or at some point, it doesn't have to even get to, uh, well, maybe it gets, uh, gets to its destination earlier, but it still keeps gets, getting prioritized, even though it's not in the network. You can think of that, right? That's theoretical. Uh, but eventually, you, you pick some other flit, and that gets prioritized. So as long as you ensure every flit is eventually picked, this is fine, right? So this is what you really need for lilac freedom in the end. Very limited partial ordering. This is called the golden flit or golden packet mechanism. Makes sense, right? OK. So of course, uh, the question becomes, how do you select the golden packet? There are some implementation issues. I will go through this relatively quickly, but a given packet stays golden long enough to ensure arrival to its destination. Clearly, if it stays golden uh, long enough, it will eventually arrive at its destination because it gets prioritized in all of the routers. And there's some maximum latency with which it has to stay golden, uh, which is the maximum no contention latency because it gets prioritized in every router, right? So this is important. You need to calculate that. You need to ensure that it, it stays golden that way. And the, uh, the way we implement this actually is very simple. Uh, there's a global uh, selection. Every router employs a global rotation policy. Every router knows this. Every router essentially knows which flit, which potential flit in the network is golden at any given point. Uh, so, because there is some maximum number of packet IDs that could be injected by every single node, and you number them. Every single node, let's say, can inject uh, 16 packets, and you have 32 packets. Uh, let's assume that a packet is a flit. Uh, every single node can inject 16 packets, and you have 32, pa uh, 32 nodes. That's 512 potential packets in the network, right? You number them, and, and basically, you have a rotation. In the first 100 cycles, which is maximum no contention latency, let's say, I prioritize packet zero from whatever node packet zero belongs to. Okay? That's, the node may have injected packet zero or may not have injected. I don't care. If I see packet zero, I'm going to prioritize it. If I don't see packet zero, I don't care. I have some other decision to make in my router, as we will see. Uh, basically, there's no prioritization based on packets. And then 100 cycles later, it becomes packet one. Packet one gets prioritized. Again, packet one may be or may not be present in the network. This gets rid of the need for any sort of uh, 
communication across the routers, right? This way, everybody prioritizes packet X. Everybody knows the packet X is the golden packet, but the golden packet may actually not have been injected into the uh, network. So, okay, basically, this is how we do it. You have source, destination, and request ID. And every router knows uh, what's the golden packet, essentially source zero, request zero. And cycle 100, as I said, it moves to source one, request zero. So there's some static rotation that happens. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. And if not, you're going to read uh, some papers also, hopefully. So what does it require? Basically, you need to properly only route the golden flit. So now this goes away. No need for full sort. We just need to identify the golden flit, which is already identified based on the static rotation logic, which is a comparison. Com essentially, it's a comparison of the source ID and the request ID, which already exists in the uh, flit. And then there is no need for sequential allocation also, as we will see. So basically, let's take a look at the router now. The router is going to be very, very simple, as we will see. Uh, let's assume that we have a two-input router, two-by-two two crossbar, our building block. Uh, basically, if you have a golden flit, there are two uh, steps here. You pick a winning flit. Winning flit is golden. If there's a golden flit that exists, clearly it has to win the arbitration. Otherwise, it's random. You randomly pick one of them. And you steer the winning flit to its desired output and deflect the other flit, basically. Hopefully that makes sense. Right? So you pick a winning flit. Winning flit has to be the golden flit if one of the inputs has a golden flit. Otherwise, it's randomly picked. And the winning flit it gets its desired output. So this ensures that the golden flit is always routed toward its destination. Now let's take a look at a 4x4 four four router. You could easily extend this to 5x5 five five as well. Uh, but basically, each block now makes decisions independently. So deflection is really a distributed decision. So this is a beauty of designing the router, I think. Uh, let's take a look at this. So each, as long as each router obeys uh, what I just said, now you can build a 4 by 4 router that guarantees that golden flit is routed to its uh, desired output port and everybody else is routed somewhere. So let's say a yellow one is golden. Uh, this router clearly doesn't have the yellow one. No golden, so randomly picks one of them. Uh, and you can see the destinations also. So the red one needs to go to this destination. Uh, yellow one needs to also go to this destination. Uh, blue one needs to go to this destination. And uh, the green one needs to go to this destination. But you can see that red one wins. Uh, the, uh, so if you go back to the steps, you pick a winning flit. In this case, the winning flit is randomly picked for this. Red one wins, meaning that red one should be routed down. So red one, this switch, this input should be connected to this, meaning that these flits should be swapped. Okay, so that's done. Here, because this is the golden flit, it has to win. And it wins. And golden flit is going this way, so there's no swap, right? It needs to take this. This is similar to the networks that we have seen earlier, right? Uh, in the multi-stage network. This is essentially a multi-stage logarithmic network. Okay, and then let's take a look at the decision that happens in the second level. Uh, Again, here, uh, what happens is there's no golden flit. Randomly, you pick one that wins. A green one won. And you swap. Both of them are happy because they went to their destinations. That's good. Here, uh, the yellow one must win because it's the golden flit. And it wins. And it gets to its destination. And the red one gets deflected. OK? So here, this way, you can design a 4 by 4 router simply using 2 by 2 routers without any oldest first uh, allocation. Hopefully it makes sense. So basically we replace this complicated thing, sorting and port allocation, sequential port allocation logic with this. Of course, it's not making optimal decisions because uh, if, if you look at this, this particular decision over here, that's, that's actually a, a very interesting one, right? Here we randomly decided to prioritize the green one, but if we, uh, well, I guess this would work. This would work. Sorry, this would be fine. We'll see some cases later on. So it doesn't matter in this particular case because they happen to uh, go here. But assume that this was, for example, some other uh, color. Uh, it, it didn't have a port uh, that it needed. It, it needed to go here, but it couldn't go here because of the golden over here. Uh, but basically, one, uh, one non-golden flit may have a productive output port over here. And another non-golden flit may not have any productive output port over here. In that case, this random selection is not necessarily good because you know that there's only one flit that is a, gold, uh, that is a productive output port. Why not pick that one, right? If you do the wrong thing, 
meaning randomly pick the other one, you would have both of them deflected. Basically, that's the downside of being extremely simple. If you're extremely simple, you're minimalist in terms of what you're trying to achieve in terms of live lock freedom, but this goes against performance. As you can see, you can increase the deflections in some other parts because you're minimalist. So this is actually interesting to also think about, right? Uh, minimalism in design is actually a design principle that many people have used in many fields. Uh, minimalism is, uh, is interesting uh, for a particular goal, but it may go against some of the other goals. And we will try to fix this problem later on. So minimalism for live lock freedom doesn't mean that it's good for performance. Okay, so basically this router is much simpler, right? Now let's take a look at the issue of reassembly buffers. This is actually also going to become very interesting. Now let's take a look at uh, the worst case. Worst case, every node sends a packet to one receiver. So you're basically congesting. Uh, this is called also a hotspot traffic. Hotspot traffic is actually quite worse. Basically you have a hotspot, everybody sends something to that hotspot. And receiver now needs to have all order of end space because assuming each packet, uh, there's one packet in flight per node, it's uh, order of n, and then you multiply it by the number of packets clearly. Okay, why can't we make reassembly buffers smaller? Let's take a look at that. Because this caused deadlock in the end. Deadlock uh, in the sense that it's a protocol level deadlock, and we will see that. Uh, so let's take a look at this example. You have many senders, and you have a small reassembly buffer that's not sized for the worst case. And there's some network, and this is one receiver. So people keep injecting, well, nodes keep injecting. I think of nodes as people. Let's, uh, yeah, I guess it's andromorphic <laughs> thinking of uh, computers, which is not necessarily true, but you can think of it that way. Uh, in the end, people may be actually controlling those nodes, right? Uh, but basically, uh, you can see that uh, the green packet arrived, but a green flit, one of the green flits arrived, but the other flit did not arrive. So it reserves the reassembly buffer, fine. Uh, so it's waiting for the other green flit to arrive. The blue packet arrived, and it's waiting for the other blue flit, uh, flit, uh, flit to arrive. Now your buffer is full. Now, what happens to everybody else? This yellow one cannot eject out of the network because buffer is full. Okay, fine. Everybody starts circling around the links and none of them can eject because remember, everybody's sending to this one receiver. Now, unfortunately, at some point, network becomes full and these two poor flits cannot get injected. And now you're deadlocked, right? Basically, your buffer is full, your network is full. There's nowhere to inject these things. And this buffer... Uh, the allocation is waiting for these two things to arrive, but they can never, never be injected. So that's the problem, basically. Uh, how do you solve deadlock? I mean, you've seen deadlock. It's very similar uh, to what we have seen, actually. You can break this deadlock somehow, right? Have a timeout and say, oh, I'm going to deallocate the reassembly buffers and, I don't know, send a message to the sender. It's a mess, basically. So that's why uh, worst case size, size buffering is actually easier, let's say. Okay, I, mean, I think I've already, I already said this, but basically this is completing the loop. Uh, we, when we saw deadlock earlier in the last lecture, we completed a loop, right? Uh, it's, it's essentially cyclic uh, dependence on resources. Basically, you have a cyclic dependence on resources over here also, and that's deadlock. Okay, now let's take a look at how... Yes, please. Uh, can... Yeah, sure. Okay, you want to go back even more, I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like what are these? Yeah. Yeah. I see. I see. Basically, they get prioritized. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a good idea. The problem is, how do you communicate all of this information to all of the routers in the network? <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, basically. <laughs> but yes, I like the thinking. Basically, how do you how do you break this sort of thing? Yes, you can certainly break this by if you give that information. So that's maybe a deadlock break breaking mechanism. But in general, that's the reason why we had the static allocation. Uh, because any kind of dynamic determination of the golden flit requires communicating that information to all of the routers in the network. And we wanted to make this scalable. Yeah, that's the beauty of distributed systems and networking, right? Okay, 
Okay, uh, so we've talked about this. So how do you break the deadlock? So one way of breaking the deadlock is uh, ask for permission, right? This usually tends to be very conservative. If every, every sender asks for permission before it sends something to a receiver. So this way, uh, you can have reassembly buffers. You reserve the, flat, the slot, you get an acknowledgement, and then send the packet, basically. That's the idea. So you basically reserve the slot uh, and get an acknowledgement. So it's saying that, oh, buffer is available, so now you can send your yellow packets. So acknowledgement comes, or yellow flits, right? Essentially, one of them goes. Now you can send the other one. I'm assuming that the other one's already got the acknowledgement and they're sending stuff. So if you do this, and this would work, right? Now, of course, this is down, the downside. There's additional delay for every request. First, you need to send a packet to reserve the slot. If you don't get an acknowledgement, you don't send the actual packet, right? So this is very fundamental. The other uh, end is uh, retransmission. Basically, sender, so this is pessimistic. We talked about pessimistic and optimistic concurrency also. It's kind of similar, right? You're pessimistically saying that, oh, I don't have the uh, buffer, so I'm not going to send it. Let's do it optimistically. Sender sends it optimistically, assuming that the buffer is free. Basically, you send things, assume that the buffer is free, but they get dropped. And the sender sends, the receiver sends a knack. And then at some point, other, another packet completes, and sender happens to retransmit the packet, then it gets a buffer. And then it gets an ACK, and then the sender frees the data. So here, if you do it optimistically, it's very similar to optimistic concurrency. No additional delay in the best case. If your buffers are available and you don't get NACKed, you don't need to do anything in the sense that you don't need to retransmit, right? So that's good. But even though there's no additional delay, you need to size the buffers over here uh, uh, for all packets because you, you cannot assume that once you send the packet, that packet is received, that that packet is going to be buffered. You may need to resend the packet, basically, because you can, your packet can get dropped. That's always a problem with dropping-based methods. And potentially, this may lead to many retransmits, right? The question is, when do you retransmit something? Right? That's always uh, an issue with uh, dropping methods. If you just have a negative acknowledgement, uh, then uh, the, the burden is on the sender to resend at some point, and that always has a problem. Uh, of potentially many retransmits. So the question is, can you somehow get the best of both worlds? And the idea is very simple here. Retransmit only once. Be optimistic initially, and then become pessimistic. That's the idea. <laughs> and this, actually, this, this sort of mechanisms are also employed in transactional memory, optimistic concurrency as well, which is interesting. So there are actually really interesting parallels between different parts of the system design. So basically, the idea is very simple. Retransmit only when space becomes available. Receiver drops the packet if it's full, if the buffer is full, and notes which packet it drops. And when space frees up, receiver reserves space so that the retransmit is successful. And receiver notifies the sender to retransmit. So let's take a look at this example. Initially, all of the buffers are full in the receiver, and you want to send some other, uh, some, let's say, different color uh, packets. You send it. Receiver says, okay, I've dropped it, but I'm going to make a note. Uh, I'm going to actually... Uh, say that this node zero request zero came to me and I'm going to allocate for it first. So it has a queue. And then a buffer becomes available and then the receiver reserves a buffer and at, some, at that point sends an acknowledgement saying that please retransmit, I've allocated a buffer for you. And then the sender retransmits. So this, is re this basically minimizes the retransmits to once. Uh, so it's not perfect clearly, but uh, it's, it, uh, it gets rid of the uh, huge buffering overhead over here, and also many retransmissions. Okay. Okay, any questions? There's also one more optimization, which actually goes to uh, the core uh, and network co-design, which is actually very interesting, which you can do in a multi-core, in an on-chip uh, system. But basically, you already have buffers. So reassembly buffers are not something uh, uh, that don't exist. For example, if you already sent out a cache block read request, you're going to get eight packets, for example, eight flits for that cache block, right? Let's say 64 bytes. You get eight bytes of eight packets each, eight packets of eight bytes each, sorry. Uh, so you need to have, you need to buffer these somewhere. And this is already exists in the processor. On the processor side, there's something called a miss status holding register or miss buffers that we have discussed in the past that keeps track of the outstanding cache misses, their addresses, and which data already came, which data did not come. Basically, this already exists in all processors today. The reason people are adding reassembly buffers in networks is because processor is here, 
And then there's a network interface like we discussed. And these are two separate entities and there's some interface between them, but they don't talk to each other. So the realization is that why not combine all of those buffering together? That's the idea. So it already exists. You keep track of status, address, and buffer. You could use this as your network buffer also, basically. So essentially, you have the reassembly buffering for free in the end. And this realization makes the, the network on chip truly bufferless, basically, because you don't really need reassembly buffers. There's nothing special that you need to do about them other than the protocol that we discussed earlier. Uh, you, you really need uh, to combine the fact that, com combine the buffering you already have in your cache hierarchy with whatever you need in the networking, essentially. So, I mean, in this course, we actually kind of broke a lot of barriers, right? This is another example of breaking barriers. Uh, why have multiple levels of buffering if you can actually get rid of some of the buffering and combine them? This is an example of that. Okay, so basically we got rid of the reassembly buffers and replaced them with what already exists, MIS buffers. Okay, so basically let's take a look at what we did. Uh, you had the baseline bufferless deflection router, which was complex. You had a long critical path uh, because of these, and we changed that to a permutation network using the golden packet mechanism. And we had large buffers uh, for worst case, and we changed that to retransmit once protocol to handle the worst case, handle, handle, uh, make, make the buffering small. And the buffering can be actually integrated with the cache miss buffers, which already exists. And the, uh, network, uh, the, the router essentially looks like this in the end. Basically, you have this permutation network, there's injection ejection logic that I didn't talk about, but you can, you can actually look at that in the paper. Injection ejection can be handled separately, basically, as a separate earlier stage, because they're not necessarily going, uh, they're, they're very special, right? They're, uh, they're, they're handling local traffic, right? Local traffic can inject into the router, and incoming traffic can be ejected immediately before going through the router, right? And as long as you detect that early, then you can actually save a lot of latency and energy. Okay, let me give you some evaluation very quickly. Uh, you can read the paper for more details. But again, we use perfect L2 to stress the interconnect. Otherwise, actually, the interconnect becomes less of a bottleneck. There are very few workloads that exercise the interconnect significantly in a multi-core system. Uh, and there's a lot of hardware modeling, and you can, you, can, you can see actually the methodology of the paper is actually quite strong. So this, uh, because the methodology is improved, uh, the results are slightly different, but not terribly different compared to the blessed paper. So here, basically, on average, there are some workloads that exercise the network a lot, like streaming, MCF. These are very heavy workloads. Uh, on average, compared to buffered, you get 13.6% uh, performance degradation on multi-programmed. On multi-thread workloads, it's actually smaller. But there are some workloads where the degradation is really small, as you can see. These aren't workloads that don't exercise network much. There are some workloads that exercise network a whole lot with a perfect L2 cache. So that's... This is unacceptable in the sense, in that sense, right? So 49.8%. So you get small loss to, for me, low to medium intensity workloads, but pretty large loss in terms of performance for very high intensity workloads. I mean, of course, these workloads can exist. Uh, the question is what fraction of the world is those workloads? It's good to know your workloads basically in the end. Uh, okay, so uh, there, there's some uh, power reductions actually quite uh, this is a very improved power model, and you can see that the power reduction is actually even higher than what we reported earlier, more than 54%. And the multi-threads are actually even higher. So you can see that uh, uh, the chipper router is very similar to BLESS, but even lower power, uh, and it's less complex also. Uh, okay, I think we've already discussed this. So removing buffers still actually provides large power savings, and optimizing the router actually even provides even more savings. The most important benefit is here, basically, the area and critical path reduction. Compared to buffered, uh, we reduced the area significantly. And uh, compared to BLESS, the critical path reduces significantly. So you, you essentially, uh, compared to buffered, the critical path doesn't increase much with this new routing, routing mechanism that treats live lock freedom the way we discussed. Hopefully that's clear. So we're trying to get the best of both worlds, if you can kind of uh, see. We want to get the uh, best uh, router area of BLESS without the critical path degradation that we see. And we kind of got it. Unfortunately, what remains is here, right? which is the intensive workloads. So if you have a very heavy intensity workload, this bufferless network is unfortunately not working very well, as you can see. So we could actually use mechanisms to throttle, as we discussed, source throttling, right? You could actually do source throttling, throttle sources, and we're going to look at that very, very briefly. That helps. Unfortunately, that doesn't 
uh, get you to the performance level of a buffered network because you're throttling, basically. You're reducing the load on the network. Yes, you're making sure that you're not really uh, saturating the network, but the saturation point is still lower compared to a buffered network, right? Uh, so basically, throttling helps, but it doesn't really uh, help a whole lot. So we're going to look at some other solution soon. Okay. I think this concludes it. Okay, I'm not going to uh, uh, summarize this again, but basically, the key takeaway is you can design a deflection router to be very, very efficient in terms of uh, energy, frequency, uh, and complexity. And you can actually get rid of a lot of energy compared to a buffered network, but at high loads, this is going to suffer. That's the takeaway in the end. And there's more on Chipper, and there's also an extended technical report that talks about the worst case uh, delays that you can get for gold because of the golden packet uh, prioritization. Okay, now we're here. This is a good time to take a break, I think. Any questions before we take a break? Okay, so let's take a 15 minute break. I mean, when you come back, I'm, I may ask you to actually fill the uh, forms or you can do the forms. What do, you, what do you want to do? Do you want to fill the forms alone on your own or do you want to fill them right now? Not that I'm going to look at them, but <laughs> I, want, I want to give you some time if that's what you desire. Oh, if some people already did it, okay. So who wants to do that in lecture? Don't be shy. Who doesn't want to do that in lecture? Okay. Who doesn't care? Okay. Okay, I think well, who doesn't want to do that in lecture kind of dominates <laughs> given the low particip participation rate. Uh, I would like, I will ask you to fill the forms, please do that. And you can do that. I mean, even if you do it in the lecture, you're going to do it on your computer anyway, <laughs> uh, because that's how it's done. Uh, but we'll send another reminder about that. Okay, so let's take a break uh, until three, and then we will continue with our exploration of on-chip networks and router design. Can you, do you have office hours? Yeah.
Okay, let's get started. Can people online hear me? Geraldo? Is it good? Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, so now we're going to continue. Uh, we're trying to make the router uh, com uh, simple, as you can see. Uh, and we figured out how to make it simple. Uh, but the question is, how do you actually make it also high performance at high loads? And that's the difficulty. Uh, that now brings us to adding some buffering. <laughs> so basically, uh, it's always good to be minimalist, but you have to depart from minimalism when you actually see that there's a need for it, right? So there's bufferless is an extreme, as I said. Maybe the right answer lies between some buffering and bufferless. So we're going to add that over here. So basically, uh, the problem is we get reduced power in area with bufferless deflection routing, but high deflection rate hurts performance at high load. And we're going to try to solve that high deflection rate. And I'll go through this hopefully relatively quickly. We will see if you have questions, we can go into more detail. But basically, this is the state of the art, if you will, uh, in terms of, let's say, very efficient router design. Uh, there have been some improvements also, but uh, this is the major work. Uh, this is called the minimally buffered deflection router. It introduces multiple things, which can be extended in different ways also. So there's a side buffer now that we add to hold only flits that would have been deflected. So this is interesting now. As opposed to buffering every flit that comes into the router, you do the routing, and in the end, you decide, oh, some flits are going to be deflected. So at that point, you're going to take them into a buffer. So it's a different kind of buffering. And it's off the I would say it's off the critical path also. So that in that sense, we're now moving into a different kind of buffering. There's also a couple of other things that this adds that are actually important. Uh, it turns out because there are some bottlenecks that cause a lot of deflections in the network. One is uh, this ejection. When a packet comes to its destination, it needs to be ejected. Two packets come to their destination. They both need to be ejected, but the destination router doesn't have enough ejection bandwidth. It can only eject, take out of the network only one packet. Why not actually increase that ejection bandwidth? Because if you actually don't eject both packets at the same time, both flits at the same time, one of them basically gets kicked away. It needs to actually go back and go around the network and come back. Well, depending on the congestion patterns, go around the network. So if you are able to actually take traffic out of the network quickly, take it out of the network. That's the idea. Otherwise, you cause unnecessary deflections in the network. So that's, where, that's another place where complexity is warranted. And there's also another place where complexity is warranted. We kind of discussed this, basically. If you actually do random decisions on non-golden flits, your deflection rate increases. Some of these are avoidable if you actually have another level of priority. So there's another level of priority that we had. In addition to golden, you can have silver, basically. Of course, you could, uh, you could keep increasing this priority levels, right? Uh, at some point, you become similar to oldest first. But another level of priority doesn't hurt the router that much. So these are the major ideas in this work. They sound simple, uh, and they are simple, actually. Uh, but they're based on observations that, uh, that uh, in these bufferless networks uh, that really hurt uh, performance and efficiency. And in the end, compared to buffered routers, you preserve a lot of power and area reduction. And you get a lot of uh, high performance uh, compared to buffered routers. And it causes half of the performance gap between bufferless and perfectly buffered. Uh, but in terms of energy efficiency, it's the best. So, okay, I'll go through this relatively quickly. And this is the paper uh, that talks about it. I think I, we already talked about a lot of these. Uh, now let's talk about some uh, of these ideas. So we, we, we've already talked all of these, so I'm going to go, skip through these. So basically, there are three key performance issues. One is link contention. Any link contention causes a deflection, essentially, because there are no buffers. This is actually very extreme, if you think about it. Uh, why would you not add some buffers if you can add them off the critical path? And that's the idea over here. That's the major idea. That's why it's called minimally buffered, right? And then there's the other realization, ejection bottleneck. If two packets simultaneously arrive at a destination, this causes deflection. It's a bad deflection because you're, all, you're at the router, you're at your destination. It's just the destination just needs to suck you up into it, right? It doesn't happen, unfortunately. 
That's the, uh, and this uh, needs to be solved also. And then there's a deflection arbitration. Fast deflection arbiters actually deflect unnecessarily. So basically, these are the ideas. I think I've already given you the ideas. You can look at the implementation, but I'll give you a couple of pictures also. Okay, I already said all of these. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we already said this, but but basically, the first key idea is to add a small buffer to, to a buffer that's deflection router to buffer only flits that would have been deflected. So this is our router right now. Uh, one of them gets deflected over here, and the other one gets to its destination. Instead of that getting deflected, what we do is we send the deflected one, basically one per cycle again, to make things simple. We move up to one deflected flit per cycle from the outputs. And that goes into the side buffer. Now the side buffer uh, gets inj uh, injected over here earlier than uh, the local node over here. So that's the idea over here. So it adds some complexity clearly into the router. Uh, whenever a pipeline slot is available, you inject from the side buffer. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of a loopback buffer, right? You're looping back into the router again, as opposed to sending it to some other link. Because deflection definitely is going to uh, push it farther away from its destination, right? You know that. That's, that's the definition of deflection, right? You, you get an undesirable output port. You keep it here so that it tries again, let's say. Okay, that's the idea. In the second cycle, if it doesn't get deflected, it takes the productive output port. Of course, then the question becomes, how do you size a side buffer? Uh, so basically, you can buffer some flits and deflect other flits at a per flit level. So relatively bufferless outers, it just reduces the deflection rate. I'm going to give you some numbers because you don't need to deflect all contending flits clearly. And you can see that four flit buffer deflection reduces the deflection rate by 39%. So even a four small four, uh, four flit buffer, it's less than a packet in today's systems, you reduce the deflection rate significantly. And relative to the buffered routers, your buffer is much more efficiently utilized because you don't need to buffer all flits. You just buffer things uh, that is just needed to be buffered after you do the routing and arbitration decisions. So you get similar performance with only 25% of the buffer space compared to some uh, some router. This is, this is not the most buffered router. It's not in comparison to most buffered router because clearly you can keep increasing the buffers significantly, right? Okay, ejection bottleneck, I think we already said this, but basically we found out that in 20% of all the ejections, more than two flits could have been ejected. Uh, all but one flit must deflect and try again, and they cause additional contention. So you want to eliminate this easy cases. Uh, and again, uh, ejection rate of two flits per cycle reduce deflection rate significantly, as you can see over here. Uh, okay, I think we already said this. Okay, basically, the, the way it impacts the router is like this. You eject one flit, and the other one, even though its destination is this local, route, local node, it gets deflected. That's the baseline. What we do is now eject, uh, well, it comes back at some point and gets ejected. But that some point may be after many, many hops in the network, right? Now, to eliminate this, basically, we have a dual with ejection which is clearly adding a little bit more complexity, but it's not that bad, right? We're not really replicating a very core part of the router, right? So if you replicate this one, okay, maybe that's more complexity, but now you're replicating this one, which is essentially a mux. Basically, you have two muxes as opposed to one mux over there. Okay. Okay, and of course, in the evaluation, you need to be careful, right? Baseline routers also have dual with ejection in the evaluation, uh, but not the power and area of the ejection logic. Okay, let's talk about this one. Uh, this is actually the extension of the golden flit. You just have a sil silver flit, basically. That's the idea. Uh, I think we already said all of this, so I'm, not, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly again. Basically, full priority order is not good. Uh, so that's why we actually, uh, uh, that leads to slow arbiters. And the deflection arbitration that we discussed is what we showed earlier, right? The chipper router has golden packet and two-stage permutation network. This is good because it has a fast critical path. Now, unfortunately, the common case is random selection over here. If you think about the golden packet, golden packet uh, prioritizes one flit uh, that's golden. Most of the time, most of the routers don't have a golden flit, right? Meaning most of the time you're doing the routing randomly, which is not good. So being a little bit more intelligent is a good idea, basically. Uh, so essentially you have uncoordinated arbitration within a router uh, because a router also consists of multiple switches, right? Which is two by two crossbars. All of them are uncoordinated, and there certainly there are other routers are also uncoordinated with each other. Okay, so I think we've already uh, said this one. So we've already said that. So basically, lack of coordination causes unnecessary deflections. So no flit is golden. Let's assume that no flit is golden. 
uh, red fluid wins at the first stage. You can see that the red fluid is supposed to go to this destination and green fluid is supposed to go to this destination. And the blue one goes over there. Green fluid blues at the first stage, which means that it's already deflected. You know that by the decision of the first stage. But it could not have lost if you had something else, right? It randomly got randomly lost to the yellow flit, which doesn't have an output port over here. Okay, and then if you look at this, red flit loses at the second stage because of the random arbitration, so it gets deflected. And the green one is already deflected, as we know. And these uh, these two flits, these two proof flits don't were not even supposed to. Uh, well, at, at least we don't show that over here. But basically, essentially, there, there are cases where all flits can get deflected because of the random decision. It's a probability game at that point, basically. So that's why I think there needs to be some more improvement in router design going into the future with this sort of mindset, if you will. But one improvement is clearly adding one more priority level and prioritize it uh, to ensure at least one flit is not deflected in each cycle. And that's the idea of this silver flit. So a uh, silver flit or silver, silver packet. So highest priority is still golden packet in the entire network. There's one golden packet. It's chosen in static round robin schedule and this ensures correctness. The next higher priority is chosen by the local router. And you, the local router chooses one silver plit for router per cycle. Again, it's chosen pseudo randomly and this enhances performance. Uh, so let's take a look at this basically. So all flits have equal priority over here. No flits is golden, but red flit is silver. We just randomly determined that red flit is silver. And red flit wins at first stage, basically. So if uh, there, are th there are three priority levels in, a, in, a, in an arbiter over here. Golden, silver, everything else is random. Right? So red one wins, the blue one gets over there. And green flit is deflected over here, fine, because the green flit is not silver. So you could actually push these decisions earlier also, but then you need to communicate across them as well. right? So basically now you have Red, uh, red flit wins at the second stage because it's silver. It doesn't get deflected. So basically, at least one, one flit is not deflected with this sort of mechanism. You could actually improve this. Uh, as I said, the decision is across the entire router right now, silver decision. You could try to make a decision across each network, but then now you're, uh, each, uh, each uh, switch. But now you're, you can see that you're increasing the complexity in the router, right? But I believe there's actually more to do in this area to minimize the deflections as much as possible. So basically, that's the final uh, design. Uh, you use, we have a side buffer to solve the link contention problem. We have a dual with ejection mechanism to solve the ejection bottleneck. And uh, to, uh, to min reduce the unnecessary deflections, there's a two-level priority scheme that chooses a silver flit, flit local to each router so that at least one flit does not get deflected if there is no golden flit, which is the common case. OK, that's the idea. Okay, let me go through the results quickly. But there, this actually paper actually has even uh, stronger methodology. Uh, so there's actually a, a lot of other works that uh, popped up after the BLESS paper. This is one of them, the AFC, uh, Adaptive Flow Control. Uh, the idea is basically to have both buffers uh, um, and deflection routing at the same time, but switch based on the load on the network. If the load on the network is low, use deflection routing avoid the buffer. So there's an express path that avoids the buffers. And if the load in the network is low, you avoid the buffers. If the load in the network is be beyond something, beyond some threshold, then you use the input buffers and avoid the deflection route. That's the idea. Yes. That's a, that's a good question. Basically, uh, you save some of the energy uh, when, uh, of the dynamic energy, right? Uh, when, uh, at low load. At low load, you save the dynamic energy. Uh, but of course, uh, once you, uh, you don't save the static energy of buffers, clearly. Uh, you don't save the area overhead. Area overhead still remains. So you get some of the benefits of deflection routing uh, without, uh, while avoiding the high performance loss. I agree that this is more complex. It's a heterogeneous. If you think about this, it's a heterogeneous scheme, right? At low load, you employ deflection routing. Don't use the buffers you already have. Uh, at high load, uh, you use the buffers and avoid, don't use the deflection routing that you have. But yes, absolutely. They, they report energy savings, but it's not uh, as high as what you would get in def pure deflection routing. Okay, and, and I mean, you're going to see it in the results also over here, perhaps. But let's take a look at these examples. So these are basically showing the deflection rates over here. Uh, and these are different mechanisms e evaluated individually and in combination. So MinBD employs all of those mechanisms. So all mechanisms actually individually reduce deflections. That's interesting. 
And side buffer alone is not sufficient for performance. As you can see, ejection bottleneck remains. So side buffer by itself actually reduces the performance compared to the baseline. Uh, and baseline is buffered, by the way. Baseline is some sort of buffered. I don't remember what sort, but you can read the paper. But you can see that the deflection rate goes down to 10%. This is average across many workloads. So you can say it's not bad, but it's also not that great in the end. So if you employ all of these mechanisms, you still have some deflections. Uh, we reduce it significantly. Uh, oh, sorry, the baseline is, buff uh, baseline is bufferless, I think, over here. You can take a look at what the baseline is. I don't remember, frankly, over here. It's probably uh, chipper. Uh, uh, but basically, you go from 28% to 10%, which is not bad. And the performance also increases. You get a higher performance over baseline uh, and you read a lot of reduced deflections. Okay, there are a lot of results. I will not go through them in detail, but you can see this is important because this is the performance. So performance is now you're much better than chipper, uh, which is the green one over here. And also better than some of the buffered mechanisms, but not as good as heavily buffered uh, designs. On average, it's not bad actually. On average, uh, this design is uh, relatively close to, uh, I guess within 3% within of buffered, four by four buffers. There's four virtual channels, four buffers in each, four packets in each. So it's not bad basically. But again, there's, some, uh, there's something that remains in between. And this is an opportunity for actually uh, more research to close the gap, in my opinion. Okay, I will not go through these, but you can see that uh, this, uh, there, there's a lot of interesting data that you can get if you actually do the simulations right. Okay, I'll, I'll skip these, you can read them. This is interesting because this is the energy efficiency graph, if you will, net network power on the x-axis and performance on the y-axis. So a chipper is somewhere here, and MinBD is actually uh, quite good over here. And to answer your question, you were asking, uh, do we get energy efficiency with adaptive flow control, switching between buffered and bufferless or deflection? Basically, it's over here, as you can see, right? The performance is higher than MinBD, but the energy is much worse, as you can see, or network power is much worse. But it's not as bad as a lot of the buffered designs also. Okay, so basically, energy, for energy efficiency, this is a good router, but if you want to get maximum performance on all workloads, clearly, uh, there's nothing that can replace buffers. <laughs> Uh, at the, after some point. And these are different designs based on the design decisions. You can read the paper for the differences across all of these designs. It's a family of buffered networks, as you can see. MinBD also has a curve, but it's not depicted in this picture. Uh, it has a curve in terms of the side buffer, how much side buffers, uh, how many side buffers you have, right? Okay, this is important, clearly. You can see that uh, MinBD increases, uh, adding buffering and adding these mechanisms that we discussed actually increases the critical path a little bit over chipper. Uh, uh, well, I guess it's, uh, no, this is area, sorry. This uh, increase the area, also critical path briefly. Increase the area, but it's not that bad. So the savings compared to buffer networks is still significant. And critical path is also a little bit higher, 7%, but I think they can be optimized actually. I believe we didn't use the perfect tools over here and also didn't design it well. But you can see that any simple thing that you do uh, to the design affects your critical path quickly. 7% may not be bad. It could be tolerable depending on your clock frequency, right? If your clock frequency is extremely high, maybe 7% pushes you to the, uh, basically increase your critical path and uh, reduces your clock frequency. But if this is tolerable within your clock period, then it may be okay. Okay. Okay, I think we've already discussed all of these and there's more in the paper. This is one of the potentially bonus papers. Any questions? So I wanted to give you this because this is actually uh, an interesting quest for making the routers as simple as possible. There's a lot of work that discusses making the routers more complex, more and more complex. And there's a lot you can find. You can find a lot of in the references, for example. Uh, I think that's not so interesting, uh, even though some of the works are interesting themselves, but th it goes against what you really want to do if you want to push for very high energy efficiency and performance at the same time. Uh, if you're pushing only for performance, there's no end to complexity in the end, right? But we're not in that regime today. That is long gone, as we've discussed, right? We, we cannot easily gain power efficiency. So our goal really should be energy efficiency in the end. So as I said, you could also do throttling. Uh, very quickly, uh, this work uh, proposes some throttling mechanisms. Uh, whenever you are congested, uh, in, uh, you want to reduce the load on the network. The question is, how do you reduce the load on the network, right? Uh, who do you throttle? And this is very similar to the source throttling that we discussed in fairness via source throttling. This paper is completely different, but uh, you can take a look at it. 
Essentially, the idea, again, needs to be application-aware source throttling. Different applications have different sensitivities to being throttled. And different applications uh, influence uh, or interfere with applications in different ways. For example, a very streaming application denies service to another application as we have seen in the past. A similar thing happens in the on-chip network also. So basically, the key idea of this work is to thr uh, heterogeneously throttle the applications. Different applications have different throttling rates and also a load-aware throttling rate adjustment. So basically, if the network load is not too bad, your throttling rate is much lower. If the network load is very high, you throttle the applications much more aggressively. Remember that curve load latency curve. Basically, if you're operating at the edge close to the saturation throughput, you're throttling much more aggressively, basically. If you're operating at the low load regime, you're not throttling as aggressively. Okay, I will not go into a lot more detail over here, but that's basically the gist of it. And there are papers written on it as well. So as we discussed, hierarchical rings are also interesting. I won't have time to talk about it, but a lot of the ideas that we've discussed actually are applicable to hierarchical rings. They're topology independent in that sense. Uh, so topology is interesting. We've looked at mesh a lot in these works, but I believe hierarchical rings actually have a very nice place as well. Uh, and you can read papers related to that as well. Uh, and the good thing is I think industry is considering these uh, maybe a little bit later than uh, we expect that, or maybe some people are implementing these without us knowing, right? We had this discussion at some point, but these folks essentially implemented a ring, a hierarchical ring that's very similar to what's described in this uh, particular work. In this particular work, we showed that actually uh, you can get uh, the highest energy efficiency with a hierarchical ring design. There are comparisons to different topologies also. Chipper actually does quite well. Chipper uh, does quite well compared to hierarchical rings also. So it's good to uh, examine more. Uh, once you go into combining topology, routing, flow control at the same time, the comparisons become much more difficult, right? Because you're really comparing entire system designs. Uh, hard clearing has some topology. Yes, you do some deflection routing, but it's not exactly the same routing anymore, right? Because your topology dictates your routing as well. So the design space becomes huge. Uh, I believe there's actually this, uh, potential for machine learning driven uh, design space exploration to actually look at this a lot. I believe there's actually very, very interesting things to be discovered over there. People today are discovering, for example, using machine learning for floor, floor planning the chips, right? That's a very tough problem. Uh, similarly, you can, do, you can use machine learning for design space exploration for different interconnect topologies. It's not just the interconnect topology in the end, topology, routing, flow control choices, right? Okay, I mean, similar thing can be done also in a processor, but uh, there are a lot of choices in the end. Okay. Okay, I can talk more about this, but we don't have time. Uh, maybe very quickly, I will talk about the study that we did with uh, compared to the networking. Uh, so uh, when, we, when you compare uh, the design of on-chip networks to the internet, for example, uh, both of them suffer from some sort of congestion. Right? In, on the internet, there's congestion, and there are congestion control mechanisms that people do, similar to source throttling mechanisms. The routers basically drop packets, and you detect that your packets are dropped, you throttle yourself, uh, or sometimes acknowledgements can be sent as well. Uh, but uh, basically, there, need, there are congestion control mechanisms. And people uh, showed that on the internet. Uh, what happens is you can go into a mechanism, uh, a, 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 a phenomenon called congestion collapse. Uh, what is congestion collapse? Congestion collapse is basically your network basically becomes flooded. And essentially, there is extremely little progress. Uh, and uh, people have used that uh, to do denial of service attacks. So denial of service attacks on the internet cause congestion collapse, for example, on some particular parts of the network. Uh, so on chip networks are similar, except they don't suffer as badly in the sense that because they're self-throttling, basically. That's one of the findings in the paper. Because the cores are self-throttling, the congestion collapse situation is not as bad as it is on the internet. Because internet, is any, any node can keep on injecting packets, right? In fact, you can... You can write traffic that just injects packets on the internet. You don't need to wait for the packets to come back. Whereas that's not the case in uh, on-chip networks. I mean, you could think about potentially writing a malicious application doing that, but at some point the cores are throttling, right? You don't you don't have uh, you you don't have access to hardware that keeps always injecting uh, networks into the node, which is not the case uh, on the internet. Okay. Uh, so basically, this work also looks at an application where congestion control mechanism, which you can read about if you're interested, which is scalable. So as I said, you could do heterogeneous networks. Uh, so especially if you want to get performance and power at, at the same time, uh, this work talks about heterogeneous networks. We don't have time to talk about it. Very interesting. And existing networks are already heterogeneous, uh, like the Tyler networks, but they're statically scheduled in the sense that 
different types of traffic go to different networks. Our goal here was to actually make things dynamically scheduled uh, to balance the load across the networks while also uh, uh, while also catering for different uh, sensitivities of applications. For example, if an application can tolerate long latencies, schedule it on the more congested network, for example. If an application cannot tolerate long latencies, schedule it on the less congested network. So based on the network type and design and power, you can actually make decisions. I think it's very interesting, actually. There's more work that needs to be done in this area as well. Does that make sense? OK, good. I'm, I'm going through a lot of ideas, as you can see, at a high level. We don't have time to cover all of them, clearly. I will cover some other ones. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. Now, let me go into packet scheduling a little bit, uh, because we have kind of looked at it, but uh, kind of also not looked at it in the, in, a sense that, in the sense that it has a lot of other issues that we have not discussed over here. So basically, packet scheduling says, which packet do you choose for a given output port? Uh, there are some common strategies, and there could be better policies based. Router needs to prioritize between competing flits. Uh, so which input port do you choose? Which virtual channel within an input port do you choose? Which applications packet within that virtual channel do you choose? So there are basically many decisions that you need to make over here. Uh, common strategies, as I said earlier, you can do round robin across virtual channels. You can do oldest packet first or an approximation of it, but we said that this is actually relatively complicated. So people actually couldn't do that as easily. Or you prioritize some virtual channels over others. Actually, all this packet first is done, except the routers are very slow, basically. <laughs> if you want to build a very high frequency router, all this packet first doesn't work uh, very well. But it's employed in real systems. There's also FIFO first and first out, actually. That uh, is not written over here. So in a multi-core environment, actually, a better policy is use, should use application characteristics, uh, as we will discuss. So this, again, goes back to uh, thinking the, of the system as to accelerate the workloads, as opposed to thinking of the system so that you optimize some network level metrics. We really want to optimize for application and system level metrics. So I'm going to talk about a, a few uh, ideas over here. So this is the packet scheduling, you know, at least in the multi-core sense, right? You have a bunch of applications running on processors, and you have a network on chip that is enabling communication of those applications with the memory, as well as with each other, as well as with accelerators, for example. So essentially, it's a critical resource shared by multiple applications. And we've already seen this picture. Uh, the question is what is done over here. So conceptually, what the router does is it basically takes packets from different applications. Different colors may uh, be different applications over here, as you can see, and then schedules each. Uh, uh, for a given output port, it decides which uh, packet gets scheduled. Right. So it's a complicated decision, clearly, as we have discussed. Uh, so existing scheduling policies are application unaware, basically. There, there, there are two issues, actually. Uh, one is application unawareness, which is problem two. The other is actually localness. So this is actually interesting to uh, think about. Golden, Golden Flit, for example, uh, makes the prioritization across the network consistent for a single flit. But if you actually have a FIFO uh, or round robin uh, or age-based, maybe age-based actually fixes some of the uh, localness, but it still depends. Uh, it can lead to contradictory decision-making between routers. So packets from one application may be prioritized at one router to be delayed at next. This is true for all this packet also, all, all, this, all this first also, if you think about the application level. So on this router, in this router, you're prioritizing application A over application B. But this other router may be prioritizing application B over application A. So everybody gets delayed in the network in the end. Hopefully this makes sense, right? It's kind of similar to, uh, at some level, it's similar to parallelism over batch scheduling, right? This bank, uh, you, this bank prioritizes application A over application B. The other bank prioritizes application B over application A. As a result, no one exploits the bank level parallelism, right? This is kind of similar, except it's much more distributed. In each router, there could be a very different decision. As a result, application a, uh, different applications get deprioritized in every single router. As a result, everybody gets uh, deprioritized overall. Basically, this is the downside of local, uncoordinated decisions across the network. One router prioritizes some application. The other router takes a complete different decision. As a result, both applications suffer. Okay. The second problem is uh, application obliviousness. Essentially, these are application agnostic, right? As a result, they treat all applications equally. So they don't optimize for what we really want to do in a network, in a, in a system, right? We want to really optimize for application level performance. But applications are heterogeneous, so you really need to take into account uh, the heterogeneity 
And you've already seen this many times in this course, right? Okay. So basically, the solution that this work proposes is more global scheduling policies that are application aware. So let's take a look at uh, an example of a scheduling policy. So these are different cores. We're looking at it from a core perspective. And these are different injection cycles. Uh, and these are packet injection orders. So we're going to uh, design a policy that actually uses batching uh, and uh, uses batching to coordinate across the routers. So again, every router follows a static batching schedule. Uh, and each core, or every, every core, I should say, every counter, uh, every core follows a static batching schedule. So for time interval until here, for example, all of these are equal to the same batch. For the next time interval, uh, you have another batch. So when you inject a packet into the network, you also inject the batch ID. This is from batch zero. And then uh, this is, these are from batch one. These are from batch two. So within a batch, you can do application-aware scheduling again. In a sense, it's, again, similar to parallelism over batch scheduling because there's some similarity uh, in the router as well as the memory controller. So basically, within a batch, you can have a ranking order that says, if I prioritize this one, it actually has not much load, so it can actually go faster. And if I prioritize this one next, it can go faster than the uh, uh, red one. So there can be some priority order. Actually, it doesn't need to be as perfectly as uh, the shortest job first, as I kind of alluded to. It could be something else also, but we use kind of a, a variation of shortest job first uh, in the router. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Uh, basically, uh, these are different batches. Uh, these are different, uh, different requests, as you can see. Let's assume that they all arrived at this router magically. It's just for illustration purposes. And the router needs to make a decision as to whom to prioritize. It basically prioritizes. Uh, this is how the round robin would work. Basically, round robin goes through all virtual channels in a round robin manner. It takes the first one, second one, third one, and you can see that it's round robining. And then once uh, you need the next packets, you go through the same router, uh, same the same virtual channels again, right? So basically, you can see that the order is really order of virtual channels. Okay, I'll go through this again. Okay. So uh, if you think about applications getting delayed, uh, and if you think about what we have discussed 10 lectures earlier, let's say, uh, the stall cycles with round robin for the green application, basically green application applications packet, last packet gets delayed uh, eight time units, assuming these are equal time units, which they are actually. Uh, blue applications packet gets, the last packet gets delayed until six time units, and the red one gets delayed until 11 time units. So basically, no one gets prioritized in this case, as you can see. And the average is about 8.3 8 over here. Let's take a look at what happens if you do age-based scheduling. If you do age-based scheduling, you pick the one that's the oldest. And these are marked in terms of uh, the old one. So one goes first, two goes next. These are the ages, basically. Uh, actually, these are the batches and ages, if you will. Let's assume that you break the ties based on some other age that's not shown here. So this is what you get. So stall cycles are still not good, as you can see. The average is 7.0. Now, if you actually impose some ranking such that you make a coordinated application-aware decision and you decide to prioritize, for example, the green application first and then the blue next and then the red next, in this particular cooked up schedule, it looks pretty good, right? So you can see that the average uh, stall cycles, the average time the last packet uh, from a given application gets serviced is 5.0. So, this picture may look similar to parallelism or batch scheduling. In that sense, it's similar, actually. But the decisions are happening coordinated across different routers. In this router, this router is prioritizing uh, like this. The other router is also prioritizing like that, assuming these three applications happen to arrive at that, uh, at that router. So all of the routers are making a coordinated decision because the batching happens uh, at regular intervals across all parts, of, uh, across all cores. Hopefully that makes sense. So there's no real coordination that happens in a, uh, in a single place, right? The batching is happening at the cores when they inject the packets into the routers. Okay. Okay. So that's the key idea, basically. I mean, there's not a whole, not a whole lot to discuss, except, of course, how do you make it work, work in a distributed fashion? How do you do the batching, et cetera? How do you design the router so that it's not that complex? I mean, those are all discussed uh, in this work. And if you're interested, you can uh, read more. But this, is, uh, this, this work shows that application-aware prioritization actually is very important compared to these other mechanisms. So if you actually use application-unaware methods, like what's been used uh, in um, 
in real networks until then, and in still, still, I think, in many networks today, uh, you lose performance significantly. So if you think about this bufferless routing that we've discussed so far is also application unaware, right? So you can combine the principles from here to here and there, but then you com you're complicating the router. So it's good to think about these things. Okay, there's another idea that I would like to also mention. This is actually very interesting, and this is a general idea again. Uh, so this work incorporates the notion of Slack, and this notion is very important. We didn't discuss this as much, but we kind of alluded to it in some works. Uh, so there's this notion of packet Slack, actually in general Slack, request Slack. Slack is the amount of time or the number of cycles uh, you can delay a packet without affecting performance, or at least significantly affecting performance, or not affecting performance at all. Uh, this is also called local network Slack in this particular paper. So why does this happen? Clearly, uh, you can you can delay a packet one more cycle, and that's not going to hurt you. You can delay a packet maybe hundreds of more cycles, and it's not going to hurt you. Well, because you have some latency tolerance, right? We've discussed latency tolerance mechanisms. So it could be memory level parallelism. There's some other packet that's on the critical path of execution. And you delay this packet, it's not on the critical path. Fine, keep delaying it until it may become the critical path, basically. So that's the idea in Slack-based mechanisms. Uh, basically, the latency is hidden. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to read this uh, again. But, but the key idea is, if you can somehow estimate the slack of a packet and prioritize packets for lower slack, you can get a much more efficient network, higher performance, as well as potentially lower energy, as, as this work shows. Uh, so that's the idea. Then the question becomes, how do you estimate the slack of a packet, right? And this idea is generally applicable, actually, to many things. People have tried to apply a version of this idea to processors, for example. If you can estimate which instruction is going to be critical on your critical path, prioritize that instruction in the instruction scheduler. Right? If you're uh, memory controllers, for example, uh, I mean, I don't believe there's a... Actually, there are some papers in memory controllers that kind of use this idea also. But basically, uh, can you, if you can estimate the slack of a, a slack of a memory request, prioritize the memory request that has the lowest slack in the memory controller. This is a notion of criticality in the end. And this work estimates the slack in multiple methods. So one way of estimating slack, uh, uh, if you're the source node, when you're injecting, you're kind of giving an indication uh, to the network that, okay, I, don't, I have a lot of slack uh, on this packet, so you can delay it for some time. And here's the time I guess you can delay it for, maybe 100 cycles, right? How does the node estimate this? Well, node can estimate this if it knows where the packet is going, right? For example, one packet may be going to uh, main memory, and you have that information somehow. Another packet may not be going to main memory. It can be serviced from a local cache, right? Or, or close by cache. And you may have some metadata information that helps you figure this out. And that enables you to actually guess how much slack a particular packet has, because you're in the end, the core will likely be bound by the packets that's going the furthest, that's going to take the longest, right? That's the idea. Of course, this is, these are heuristics, right? It's not a complete exact mechanism. You may use heuristics to decide which packet is more important and how much slack it does it have. This paper proposed a mechanism. By, by no means, this is the best mechanism, uh, but it is the best mechanism at the time. And I would recommend uh, reading it because it's a very different notion uh, than what we have discussed so far. And it also gives you a different idea of uh, you know, what it might enable. I believe this sort of policies are actually going to be a lot more important in systems. Uh, if you think about our systems, uh, we, uh, I mean, in a lot of the things that we have discussed here, we did not introduce this notion of slack, right? Or notion of criticality. Tomorrow's lecture, whether online or in person, we will see, uh, it's going to be all about criticality. So in that sense, it's a good tie into tomorrow's lectures. Also a criticality in a very different sense. Uh, so our policies are actually quite inefficient because two things are not equal. One, one thing is a lot more important than the other one. The question is, how do you determine that thing is very important? In this particular case, it's about performance. Uh, you can actually say, uh, okay, this, uh, based on, um, I mean, we kind of saw this in uh, Rahul's lecture, if you remember the Hermes lecture. Uh, the Hermes work tried to predict which, uh, which uh, requests to the memory system are going to miss in the caches. And those requests are prefetched earlier, right? You could use that information to also prioritize requests. So this request is going to actually miss in the memory system based on my prediction. And I'm going to predict that it has little slack because of that reason, right? Everything else may have higher slack if you have concurrent requests, for example. So those sort of mechanisms can actually enable you to 
uh, decide which uh, requests have less slack versus more slack. Okay, enough on this one. There's a lot more that goes into actually making this work, and that's in the paper. Any questions? So there are a bunch of things that I'm not going to talk about. We don't have time. This is actually a very, very fun field. Uh, and there's, you can do slowdown estimation in the network. It's much more complicated than slowdown estimation in a single memory controller. There are a lot of issues like multicast, hotspot. Uh, so there are a lot of issues in the network, basically. Let's keep it that way. Uh, there, there's quality of service. This paper we had discussed actually very, very briefly. This shows that you can do denial of service in the networks much worse than you do in the memory controllers that we discussed. But there's a solution also over here. Unfortunately, once you want to add quality of service, guaranteed delivery, uh, or uh, or some sort of latency guarantees, the router has become much more, more more complicated as well. So if you look at the router and this work and some other quality of service works, they're complicated. In fact, in fact, this work tries to make the router less complicated compared to some other past quality quality of service mechanisms. So how do you actually provide some latency bounds without complicating the router? That's still an important problem. And that's kind of a segue to what I'm going to talk about next. So I'm going to talk about this one later, but actually maybe I'll talk about it now. But I will introduce uh, something else. So basically, uh, uh, the issue is, uh, as you scale to thousands and thousands of nodes, uh, router complexity matters even more. Because in the end, you're bound by design power in a chip. And if your routers are complex and energy hungry, uh, then that's going to limit your scalability. And this is actually important on all kinds of systems. Uh, this work actually has authors from NVIDIA. And they're actually interested in scaling up their systems significantly. And that makes a big difference uh, in the designs. So if you look at a GPU, for example, it has a, a, a very hefty interconnect today so that you can connect all of those cores, of which there are many, many, to the memory downstream. And that is an interconnect, basically. So it's not, they, don't, they cannot afford a crossbar in that interconnect, clearly. And they need some quality of service also. And if you look at a more complicated GPU, like an SOC, which it has not just the GPU, but it also has cores. Now those all, those all feed into the interconnect. It's a common interconnect. Some of them may be sharing caches. So everything we discussed earlier in terms of memory controllers get amplified in the interconnect. Because it's not just a single memory controller or multiple memory controllers. It's everywhere. Basically, shared resources everywhere now. And it has to be energy efficient. It has to be scalable. It has to be high performance. It has to provide quality of service on top of that. So this work tries to tackle a lot of those at the same time. I'm just going to give you some of the key ideas. Some of the other key ideas are low level, and you can read the paper if you're interested. But basically, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the key realization is that we don't want to make the routers more complicated than they need to be, handle some of the problems in the topology. And that's actually a very interesting insight that we have never seen anywhere before. Handle some of the issues in the topology so that the router becomes less complicated. OK, these are some pictures. So. Yeah, I think we're in this near future, actually. This, this work was published in 2000, uh, uh, 2012. Uh, actually, it was done uh, until 2011 or so. But we're, we're actually very close to 1,000 agents. I didn't count clearly all the agents that we have. But if you think about GPU cores, we have a lot of GPU cores and a hefty GPU. If you look at the Cerebras' engine, the machine learning accelerators, big machine learning accelerators that are ready for scale, they actually have thousands of uh, processing elements. I don't, I don't actually remember the number. So we're there basically today. This work was done 10 years ago. So keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, so basically, you need everything, uh, high efficiency, low area, low energy, good performance, and strong service guarantees in a network that can support thousands of agents. OK, basically, the problem is quality of service support in each router is expensive because you need to buffer packets in general if you want to provide quality of service really well. You need to arbitrate. You need to bookkeep. Uh, usually what's employed, uh, at least the parameter virtual clock, for example, the paper, it's a virtual time-based mechanism. You basically keep count of which flows have been serviced for how much, and you basically um, try to prioritize the flows that have not been serviced as much. This is a form of least attained service scheduling, for example. But that's not, just, that's not purely quality of service. That's trying to provide some sort of fairness, fair scheduling. If you really want to support quality of service, you need to have different traffic classes. Maybe even latency guarantees, like uh, this is the latency that I've experienced so far, and I cannot afford more latency, so prioritize. So there's a lot of bookkeeping that you need to do. So quality of service can be actually defined in terms of latency, bandwidth, slowdown. There are many different definitions also. So basically, this complicates the router significantly if you need to handle everything in the router. And uh, this paper actually covers a lot of those issues, which we don't have time to cover. 
So our goal, as I said, was to provide quality of service guarantees at low area and power cost. And the key idea is isolate the shared resources in a region of the network and support quality of service within that area. So basically, you minimize the amount of quality of service you have in the network. Some parts you say, okay, this is lost cost. I have to provide quality of service here. So it's expensive over there. Now, how do you get to that part? Basically, you should not have interference. You should not have things that break quality of service in the other parts of the network. This is where the topology comes in. Design the topology so that applications can access the region without interference. This is where the earlier topologies that I showed you, low diameter topologies that provide direct access from one node to a shared region, enable uh, you to do this uh, nicely. So that's the idea. So in that sense, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a culmination of the ideas that we've been discussing so far. Okay, so let's take a look at this issue. So this is a potentially a real system. It's a very small system, as you can see. I don't know why the color doesn't match, but shared resources are these, uh, the, the blue ones over here. Somehow it happens to be that way. Multiple virtual machines are sharing a die over here. And then there are some VM virtual machine private resources. This belongs to virtual machine one, for example. This belongs to virtual machine two, for example. It gets divided over here. Virtual machine three is here. And some other virtual machine one parts are here. So somehow there's some allocation that happens. And virtual machines cannot get allocated multiple cores clearly. Right? And all of, the, all of these routers are quality of service enabled, as you can see. If virtual machine and virtual machine one may be communicating from here to here, right, somehow. And virtual machine two, virtual machine three can be doing that also. So there could be many contention scenarios over here, right? Uh, you can have shared resources. You can have memory access, for example. So this virtual machine may want to access the memory over here. And then there could be another virtual machine trying to access memory over here. They contend all across the network. And quality of service mechanisms help both of them hopefully get the quality of service. There could be, uh, so we don't want that necessarily because we don't want quality of service everywhere in the routers, right? So how do you handle that? There could be intra-VM traffic also, uh, and there could be inter-VM traffic uh, that actually cause these problems. The paper details them, but we don't have time to go over all of these. But basically, there are many different scenarios in which you get, uh, uh, you rely on these quality of service aware routers across the network, right? So two virtual machines may be communicating with each other also or communicating to memory. We will see that as well. Uh, so if two virtual machines, for example, share pages, uh, how do they interact with each other? They, they have to go through basically, if, if virtual machines are allocated this way uh, and uh, also shared resource are all over the place and there's no, uh, the network is designed in a way that there's a lot of interference to get to the shared resources and to enable the communication, you have to have quality of service in all of the routers in your network, basically. So we want to eliminate that. Uh, so we basically want, what we want to get is network-wide guarantees without network-wide quality of service support, if you think about it that way. And this is actually a worthy goal because these things are expensive in the end. Expensive in terms of not just cost, it's expensive in terms of energy as well as performance. So basically the insight is to leverage in, uh, rich inter uh, network connectivity naturally reduce interference among different applications, flows, virtual machines, and limit the extent of hardware quality of service support. And this requires a low diameter topology. And actually any low diameter topology would work over here, uh, but we use multi-drop express channels because it's a low cost, low diameter topology. So let's take a look at this. This is a single dimension. Uh, you can see one row and four uh, nodes. The idea of multi-drop express channels is essentially this. You have a single bus type of channel, and then you have multiple drops. It's a multi-drop bus, bus, basically. So you need to have some sort of small arbitration over here to decide this is destination. So you need to do ejection over here. So there's some buffering. So basically, this is a low diameter topology because if you're sending from here to here, it just goes in a single link. There's no router in between. It's just a drop that you need to do. So there's this very small arbiter that, to ensure that it drops at the right place. And you can see the design in the original HPCA paper. So basically, it looks like this, multi-drop express channels. Uh, yeah, this is a multi-drop bus, as you can see. And it looks like this internally. And then you keep adding it in all dimensions. And this is what you get in the end. <laughs> okay. So the router, uh, I mean, inside here, you have a complicated router, of course, because you're receiving uh, from three places over here and you're sending to three places. But you can, uh, you're sending to four places. Well, assuming it's a torus in this particular case, of course. Okay. So uh, if you read the MEX paper, uh, there's, some, there's actually very interesting pros and cons for different topologies, but this is a one-to-many topology. Uh, one of them gets connected to many, as you can see. It's low diameter, two hops. That's the important part. And um, some things I did not discuss, but you can look at it. 
So it's asymmetric, but there's some increased control complexity, but you can read the paper for more detail. So basically, we're going to use that sort of network. This is the topology of our quality of service. This is the shared resource. These are the shared resources on the right. You dedicate the shared resources to be there. These are dedicated quality of service enablers. Here, you have quality of service support in the routers, in the memory controls, everywhere. But the rest of the die, you keep quality of service free, if you will. And uh, now this is good, right? Now the problem is, if you want to reach, uh, if you want to reach this, you need to do something in the network over here, as we discussed, right? And that's where we actually have the richly connected uh, multi-drop express channel topology, right? This virtual machine can directly reach here because there's a multi-drop bus over here. Uh, similarly, this virtual machine can directly reach here. So both of the virtual machines at the same time can reach here because it's a multiple topology. You can see there's a channel over here and there's another channel from here. Right? So if this virtual machine from here wants to reach this quality of service node, it uses this link. If this virtual machine wants to reach this uh, quality of service enabled router or shared resource, it uses this link. And they're completely independent of each other. So essentially they're interference free because of the design of the network. I glossed over some of the design issues in the network, but you need to read the paper for more detail of the multi-drop express channels. And again, as I said, there's nothing special about multi-drop express channels. We could have easily used a flattened butterfly network, for example, which has very similar properties uh, to multi-drop express channels. The key is low diameter network and interference freeness uh, in the dimensions where you need the interference freeness. And here we satisfy that. So, okay, virtual machine one wants to communicate with virtual machine one parts over here. How do you do that? Well, unfortunately, this topology is not good enough to support that. To be able to support that with topology, you need to have a direct link from here to here, which is very tough. Or you need to have a direct channel that's dedicated. But that's also very tough. So now uh, the traffic, uh, the intra VM traffic that's green uh, in VM2 can contend with intra VM traffic that's red over here. So clearly there's contention uh, because they have to go through the same link. Make sense? Because you know it needs to take a turn over here. Even though this part, this link is different from this link, there's no interference between these two over here. There is interference between these two because they need to use the same link to get to the uh, to, to these two destinations. Of course, if you're completely richly connected, maybe you could avoid that also, but that's a very expensive topology. But in this case, what we do is this. You have special routing loops to manage interference. So now actually, not only topology, but routing is modified to manage the interference so that we avoid quality of service mechanisms here. Okay, what are those special routing rules? Well, if you want to take a turn so that you get connected to some other part of the network, uh, which you need to get connected to by taking a turn, take that turn in the quality of service enabled region. That's the idea. So this way, virtual machine one, because of the way things get allocated, it knows that it has to go through some other virtual machine space so it has to go through, if, if it wants to be interference free uh, and have quality of service, it needs to first send the message to the quality, uh, quality of service aware router, which sends the message to its other piece in the network. So hopefully this kind of clarifies what's going on, right? Virtual machine two can uh, use its own internal connectivity over here because it, the, the information is such that it knows that these resources are allocated to itself and can freely communicate internally without interference with anyone else. But other virtual machines that are separated, if you will, in terms of their resources, they have to first go to the quality of service enabled region, and then from the quality of service enabled region to the destination piece of the virtual machine, if you will. Now, this is interesting because now we're actually trying to solve the quality of service problem, not by throwing quality of service to each router, but designing a topology that minimizes interference, which it does in some cases, but when it doesn't work, design the routing algorithm to avoid the interference, or at least avoid the interference, well, certainly avoid the interference, but also go through the quality of service enabled region to get quality of service. So this is an example where you can combine all of these, everything we've learned so far, uh, topology, routing, flow control, and quality of service, even though we didn't talk a lot about quality of service over here, to actually get to a solution that is much more scalable as the paper shows. Okay, so I think uh, I've already discussed this. There, there's a bunch of other stuff that the paper does that I'm not going to go into, but you can actually optimize the flow control. Uh, if, if, you care, if you're careful about what's going on over here, you can 
uh, design a flow control mechanism that reduces the buffer requirements in these regions. Uh, it doesn't go all the way to deflection and bufferless routing, but it reduces the buffering. And that actually helps the energy efficiency and scalability. Uh, and the paper does a bunch of evaluation and uh, I'm not gonna go through this, but basically the area of this is much lower uh, than prior mechanisms. This is basically multi-drop express channels with some quality of service and uh, support in every router. This is the final uh, kilo knock design. And you can see that the area is almost health because you reduce, the, you get rid of the quality of service support uh, in the routers. Uh, and you also do optimize a bunch of buffering uh, in the routers. This is energy, as you can see. And these are different intermediate stages that I'm not going to talk about. This is quality of service support in every router plus mix. And this is kilo knock, as we have discussed. You can see that the energy is much lower. Uh, and there's also, uh, based on the traffic pattern, you can also see. Okay, so uh, there are multiple principles that we kind of discussed. Just to uh, put this back, it's, in the end, it's a heterogeneous substrate, right? We, not all routers are the same. Some routers are quality of service capable. Uh, and uh, topology uh, helps uh, quality of service because it enables you to limit quality of service support to some routers by leveraging these low diameter topologies. It also improves knock, uh, network ownership area, as we discussed. I didn't show, well, I guess I showed energy efficiency but it doesn't impact performance significantly while, it, while providing strong service guarantees. Again, those evaluations are in the paper. We don't have time for that. Any questions? I kind of distilled uh, a lot out of a very complicated design for you <laughs> with the key ideas. But if you read the paper, you will see a lot more complicated things to do uh, to provide quality of service actually. And if you really don't want to read the details of it, this is a shorter version. <laughs> And that shorter version is a lot more, let's say, watered down in terms of the detail. Okay, but in the end, it builds, builds on some sort of network, like multi-drop express channels. So these, uh, these express channels are important because it enables express connectivity from one region of the network to another region. Uh, this is not the first paper on express channels, clearly, but this is specific papers on express topologies. It also provides a formalization of different express cube topologies. These are called express cube topologies in general. Uh, basically, whenever you have express channels from one side of the network to another side of the network, and you do, you do have to have them if you want to have a low diameter in a network, uh, it's called an express cube topology. And if you want to read more about the formalization of it, you should definitely take a look at this paper. There are old papers that actually build a theory of interconnects, uh, like Bill Daly's papers. Bill Daly is one of the authors of the book that I mentioned. And this paper actually advances that theory a little bit also. So there's a theoretical contribution as well if you're interested in that. Normally, I don't uh, look at theory a lot, but there's some theory that you can develop over here. It breaks down when you actually feed applications to it. <laughs> when you actually feed applications, uh, that theory is nice, but it's very hard to predict the performance of a network uh, because it's all dependent on the application patterns. Okay, that brings me to the end of this lecture. There's actually more to cover, but I didn't expect it to cover it because, uh, so I put it in backup slides. So if you're interested in more, there's some more in the backup slides. Uh, but I will say that this is actually uh, uh, a really important area that people need to focus on with a different mindset going into the future, because this is, this is a, a very important part of the communication substrate, not just on tip networks, but interconnects in general. In, in general, I think we need to focus more on that. In the research community, uh, unfortunately, there is not as much focus, uh, but in the end, I think this will come back. <laughs> there was a lot of focus, let's say 2000, 2009, 2010 area, and then... Uh, yeah, there was less focus, let's say. Uh, people focused a lot on memory. Memory is important, clearly. But this doesn't mean that interconnect is not important. <laughs> so there's less focus, unfortunately, in the research community. That means that maybe a good idea to actually develop big ideas right now so that it can have a lot of impact going into the future. So the fact that research community is not examining something doesn't mean that it's not important, basically. Or the community that is not examining something in general. We saw that in systolic arrays. That's my, one of my favorite examples. Systolic arrays have not been examined for such a long time, but people figured out that systolic arrays are actually very useful for machine learning accelerators, for example. Okay, I will stop here. Any questions? Yes, please. Um, during the lecture, you talk about many like um, mini, um, mini um, optimization skills, as I, you also mentioned, local to the routers. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you have this global mm -hmm. to the, in the whole networking optimizing, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, like this memory controller. Maybe we can also, because I think each router have a limited choice of routing. 
and the topology is also fixed. It's not like changing through different tasks. Yeah. So maybe we can simulate what's going to happen given every time, every minute you have a new task and given what's already simulated of the previous task mm -hmm. in, into the future, you re-simulate in the future what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the simulator, you are able to find out where is it is the con congestion mm -hmm. or where the biggest traffic are. And then you make some new plans mm -hmm. according to what's going to happen. Yeah. So it's a little bit more like global adaptive mm -hmm. simulator. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think, uh, I mean, there are some things that I did not discuss, like global uh, policies. You have a global controller, for example, that uh, that tries to figure out the congestion and basically tries to uh, map the tasks differently so that you reduce the congestion either during execution or in the next execution. Yeah, certainly there, there, there are works that are, this is a huge field, so there are works like that. But I agree that uh, I think that sort of information is also important. Yeah, but I was wondering like how this simulation could be simulator could be implemented in the hardware. As <laughs> as in software, we have compiler. Maybe this has also like router compiler to mm -hmm. router scheduler to really um, plan for every step for the router. I see. Yeah, I mean that's uh, why do you want to implement in hardware? Why not in some sort of operating system scheduler, perhaps? Right. I guess because a network is very basic, um, basic fundamental devices for a first SOC. So if you put things on software, it becomes slower. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, I mean, that's part of a research direction, I would say. Basically, how do you, how do you figure out what will happen in the future based on some simulation and then adapt your policies? Uh, yeah, I mean, there will be some hardware cost, clearly, to predict what will happen in the future if you want to simulate. And simulation may not be perfect also, right? Because uh, it could be expensive. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, these sort of policies uh, 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 are certainly interesting. I mean, there are many applications of it. For example, if you see some parts are really congested and you expect that it's going to be congested, you may remap the application a different way, right? For example, you may remap the virtual machines over here in a completely different way, right? So certainly those things can be employed. It's like a memory controller trying to optimize the best performance around different memories. And then this is like a global global rotor controller to reach the maximum. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense, I think. And on chip, you have actually a lot more possibility for that. Because uh, on chip, uh, yes, chips are getting bigger today. It's becoming more difficult, but Comparatively to the huge distributed system on chip, you have a lot more possibility for global control. Definitely, yeah. Okay, any other questions? I think we're on time anyway, so. Okay, uh, so we're done. Uh, we will have another lecture tomorrow. We'll tell you how it happens. Uh, it may be online or it may be a video that we play that you can watch, we'll see. If I cannot, it, it all depends on my conflict tomorrow, which is an important conflict and was scheduled a long time ago. <laughs>